This is Eric Rutan of Cannibal Corpse. You are listening to the Scars and Guitars podcast with Andrew McKay-Smith. G'day, everybody. Welcome to the show. I'm so pleased to bring you another conversation with Dan Mitchell, a.k.a. Autumn's Eyes. He's coming to you all the way from New England in the United States. Now, the catalyst for this chat is just because Dan and I get along, we're mates, and Every once in a while, I want to post an episode where the whole purpose of it is to just talk about whatever the hell we feel like discussing. So throughout this conversation, we talk about new music from Autumn's Eyes, Taylor Swift, Australian accent, 70,000 tons of metal, a cruise, DMT or ayahuasca, heavy metal, so much more. It's all here. A bit like my conversations with my mate James McIlroy, ex Cradle of Phil. The conversation goes wherever we feel like taking it. And this is another great example. So here he is, Dan Mitchell, aka Autumn's Eyes. Hey, there he is. Here he is. The the meeting that uh, conspired to never happen has is happening. There we go. <laughs> <laughs> the earth gonna uh, open up and we're gonna fall into the uh crust here or what? I think so. Maybe stranger things have happened, but uh, yeah, it's been a hell of a sequence of events over the past. Well, on a, at a micro level, the past 40, 24 hours, but uh, just been so busy. But I know you've been flat out too with your the creating of new music there as well. Yeah, we've both been pretty busy. How are you feeling? First of all, I know you were kind of laid up a little bit, or yeah, yeah. I uh, when I uh, well, obviously uh, you saw I went to seventy thousand tons of metal, but from that. Yeah. I, got a, I got an infection. I know I picked it up in Dominican Republic um, and um, we'll spare the gory details, but it was on here. And um, it, I, as soon as I got back on the boat, I could feel it and I thought, oh, my God, I, can't, I don't have any antibiotics with me or anything. And we know when we travel to the Philippines where my wife's mother's family are that you've got to bring some stuff like that because there's no doctors there like there is in the States or the or Australia. Oh, yeah, okay. you know, just rock up to a general surgery. You got to go to a hospital, you know. And I thought, yeah. Anyway, it stabilized for, for thank God it stabilized for the journey back. And then it started to get worse here. And I thought I better go and see a doctor. Saw a doctor who prescribed something called amoxicillin, which is a type of penicillin. But it's not that I'm allergic to it, but I have a reaction to it, which causes a lower bowel infection. And um, oh, the last one was brutal. 2018. Yeah. Yeah. 2018. Now this is very mild compared to that one, which laid me up in hospital for five or six days. But uh, nonetheless, I've got to, I feel like I'm going through COVID again because I've got to isolate because it's very infectious and I'm uh-huh. on some other antibiotics at the moment. So there you go. <laughs> Damn. I, just one of those situations oh. mate, that happens occasionally. Must be getting old. There you go. Oh, yeah, that's what my doctors tell me every time I see a doctor. They say, at your age, and I'm like, what do you mean at my age? I don't want to hear that. <laughs> yeah, I know. It's, uh, well, the medical fraternity is set up to approach everybody as a demographic. And uh, I, I can mm. understand that to an extent. But uh, to be, I'm 45, and to be thinking that I'm approaching middle age is really strange because <laughs> I guess it's the reality. But when I think back to my father at the same period of time, he was an old man. You know? I know, right? Isn't that strange? And you look at pictures or like, even if you watch old TV from the 80s or 90s and like you see what people our age looked like, they look ancient. They look like shit half the time too. They look like they've lived (laughs) very hard lives, especially, have you noticed this? This has been going on for a while now, but the introduction of HDTVs will get it out. Oh, yeah. You see the up close and personal facial features of some famous actors and actresses. And you're like, Oh my God, wow, look at that. <laughs> There's yeah, hair. They look like a leather wallet. Some of them do. Yeah. And they got yeah. hair where they, you didn't think they had hair and it sort of ruins the fantasy in some ways. <laughs> yeah. That's pretty rough. When's the, yeah, the, you're on, you go. I know. I was just going to say that the sickness thing has been going around here too. Cause Everybody I know has been sick. We've been sick every month since October because our kids started school. Mm. And he's actually on amoxicillin now, too. He had an infection, laid him out. And there you go. Yeah. He was puking his brains out, and it's just going around. We're ready for nice weather and ready for all this stupid snow to go away. That's for sure. Yeah, we, we've already had an exchange over this, but I'll trade you because right now it's 32 degrees Celsius. So I don't know what that translates yeah. to. Uh, in, uh, but, 
yeah, it's just the humidity is killing us at the moment, and but that's normal. But every year it returns, and February is just absolutely disgusting. And really, yeah, I, I know I get it. Cold weather, weather's worse because machines stop working and snow tends to pile on the roads. I totally understand all of that, but we don't have we're not South Africa here, so we don't have rolling blackouts or anything like that. But we yeah. do blackouts because everybody's using air conditioning. Oh yeah. Yeah, so we got one last night, and they only last for a period of time, but they can blow things, as you know. Like my air conditioner mm-hmm. doesn't work, so. <laughs> <laughs> Wonderful. Throw it on the pile. Exactly, exactly. So, um, yeah. yeah, it's been – when I was in Miami, I was just joking with some of them. Yeah, I've, I've come here to cool down, which is kind of the truth. <laughs> <laughs> Did you notice a big shift in Miami and on the, the boat and everything as far as heat and weather goes? Oh, yeah, it was colder. Not a lot colder, really? but five to – oh, yeah, Miami, one morning I woke up and it was – I don't want to misquote, but I think it was about eight degrees Celsius. Oh, wow. So, yeah, it can get that – in winter it can get down to that here, but it's not – you might get a week of occasional weather like that. Um, really? Yeah, it was eight degrees one morning, and uh, I, rem- I I wore – T-shirt, my long sleeve, and my denim jacket too. I was freezing, man, and that's downtown Miami. Oh, so, damn. and but it was like that years ago when I was in California. I remember thinking that was supposed to be really hot, but it wasn't like that at all. Yeah, the Hollywood and the media just sell that vision, but I thought it was going to oh, yeah. be the only place that I've been to that resembles around here. Miami does definitely, but Hawaii. Oh, okay. Yeah. Hawaii with the humidity. It was very similar yeah. because it's we're subtropical that venture into tropical. Mm. And Hawaii, one of the girls there was talking to me and, and I said, is it different and different here to there? And I said, Well, it looks different, a little bit different, but overall I'd say that if you live here, you could live there easily and not notice too much difference in terms of the weather. But that's speak to someone from Sydney or Melbourne, they'll tell you something completely different because it's more <laughs> I'm sure. I'm nope. a bit distracted by the uh, the bass in the background. Is that a new toy or is that an old ah, one? That's my war horse, man. This one, this one is the one I've used for for a while now. Um, oh, okay. It's, there you go. Uh, yeah, it's a. I, w- I won't be able to just with the nature of the video, but it's got an embossed. Um, well, it's slightly raised, so I guess it's embossed or reverse of it. Mm. It's somehow done into the into the body of the um, guitar, but it says uh, it's a 30th anniversary limited edition. So they only made a couple of these. Oh wow! I want to say a couple. Very two, cool. Of a gold hardware. Um, but I'm moving away from it. I don't know whether you saw my video, the status bass that I got from the UK. No, I didn't see that. So it's in the car because I've been gigging a lot. But uh, yeah, I know you've I'm, been gigging a lot, but. Yeah, so I just it's just easy. I've got a band van. My Jeep is my band van these days, so I just left it. Oh, okay. I just left it in there and um status Mark King from level 42, Chris Wilson mm. home from Muse and V Man from or uh I can't Alex, I think is his real name from Slipknot, the bassist there. Uses oh, okay, cool. Well. And they just cut nice. right through. You don't even have to turn it up, it just boom. Wow. It's graphite, graphite wafers throughout the neck. Oh wow! So much lighter. No, it's not lighter. It just punches well above its weight in terms of tone. Um, huh. And uh, I love music, man. And they're like, they're they they have just been so consistent for so long. Except when I had a broken truss rod, that was a different story in my Sterling. So mm. uh, I don't know what Music Man did there, but this, it rusted. It oxidized. It had rusted the truss rod. Oh wow! Never that seen that. Sound good. No, my, my luthier had never seen it before. So huh. um and maybe it's maybe it's the conditions here, the humidity here that did it to it. I, I who knows, you know, but yeah, could be. Um I wanted what I really wanted was a headless base. I wanted didn't want a headstock. Oh really? No headstock. Yeah, no. Nah, I didn't want one. I had I had a very odd experience about six months ago when my guitarist came over and started retuning my bass as I was playing it. And yeah. I was like, Fuck off! What are you doing? You know, and, uh, and uh, while you're on stage, well, we well, playing, like literally playing. I remember the song. It was uh, bloody, or you know, one of my least favorite to play, which is "Smells Like Teen Spirit," because all of the <laughs> all the drinkers want to hear that at you know twelve fifteen in the morning, one o'clock in the morning, to finish up. 
<laughs> and it came over and, and touched a tuning peg. And it's not because of that, but I thought, well, this is another advantage of having a status with that has you can get a head one with a head or one without one. And I just think they look cooler. <laughs> it's the other thing. Yeah. They are pretty badass, I'll give you that. Yeah, I've got to buy new strings though. So I've got a bunch of Ernie Ball uh, strings here in the gauge that I like for the five string, but I'm gonna to have to buy double, they've got a ball on each end. And oh, okay, a couple yeah. of companies that I think do it, status is one. So they cost a bit huh. more meat, but you know, when music it, money is no object, really, clearly is it. <laughs> <laughs> I know the feeling. <laughs> yeah. How's uh how did the recording go? I know you were you were doing regular updates and I was following your progress there, but uh did everything turn out the way you hoped? Uh yes and no. No, because of the sickness that kept screwing up the release date because this thing was supposed to be done in October mm. and it just kept getting pushed. Every time I was ready to release and do press, I would get sick and then it would push it back. I couldn't work on it. Couldn't do the last finishing touches. So could pushed back to November, got sick in November, then December the holiday came and then January I was all ready to go and then got sick again, got a, uh, um, what the hell was it called? It was like a um, respiratory infection. So I couldn't talk. I couldn't do anything. It was just awful. So finally now it's like everything's gone and fingers crossed. Nothing's uh, come across the desk as far as viruses go. So should be good to go for like a March release, I think. Okay, great stuff. Yeah. Yeah, cold weather does that too, doesn't it? Once you, once you get knocked oh, out, yeah. it's hard to get back up again. Yeah. There were nights where it was like going outside, you know, and checking the mail or whatever. It was minus five. Sometimes and with the wind chill, it's even colder. So it's like, it's just brutal. How do you go with heating in a house? Is it is it all thermal heating, meaning it's all ducted, or how does it work? Yeah, it's all duct. It's like the same thing. We have the air conditioner running through the same unit, and um, hmm. so it all just forces through the ducts around the house. But it's it's expensive, man. It gets up there. Like we try to keep the heat low, but you know, prices keep going up. Every time the heat or it gets cold, the prices go up. Funny enough. Yeah. Well, I know you and I don't talk politics, but has that been uh, on the agenda in your area there about energy prices? Um, I guess. I mean, the way that it works out here is that you have like I don't want to bore anybody with the details, but like the main energy company, you can actually choose the supplier that you want, mm. and there's different suppliers around the U.S which it, I don't know why they do this because like if you go with the supplier that's in Connecticut where I'm at, you're play, paying like, I don't know, let's say 35 cents a kilowatt versus you choose your own supplier out in Texas, which is what we do now. You pay like 10 cents per kilowatt. So, I mean, you can pick and choose, but if you don't, most people don't even know about that and they end up getting screwed, you know, paying up the uh, rear for that. The illusion of competition, maybe. Yeah, exactly. That's and exactly monopolize certain areas and just have another bit player there just to make it look like there's a choice. You can go with them if you want, but you pay much more. But yeah, maybe people exactly. don't know to your point. Yeah. Yeah, we you know. what? Know. Oh, no, go ahead. No, you're right, mate. You go for it. I was going to change direction, so if you want to finish up. No, I was just going to say we uh, – I think there's an issue with gas here. They're trying to cut off gas supply, particularly in Melbourne and Victoria. But uh, around us, we have gas here too. But oh, wow. the, it's it's not it's not a as though we have supply issues. It's not like we have uh, you know they're shutting down so many coal fired power plants that we have issues like what they do uh, elsewhere. It's more that everybody's using everything at the same time, and the grid is just isn't designed to cope with everybody having their air conditioner on. So oh, damn. that's all, that's all there is for us. Yeah, it's. Uh, Apart from that, mate, nothing that going to the pool or the beach can't solve. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> I was going to say, speaking of um, yeah. throwing money away, one of the biggest headaches of this album release was the uh, the PR campaign that I tried to start. And yeah. perhaps there's like other musicians listening to this right now that might benefit from this, but it's almost like a word of caution against you know hiring a PR agency to work with you. Because, man, I learned some stuff and it was not pretty. I initially, I was looking for a PR company to help me do some promotion for this. And 
I narrowed it down to like five different agencies. Most of them were charging about, I don't know, 400 bucks a month, let's say. Yeah. American. Um, they were all, you know, willing, ready to go. They were small potatoes compared to the bigger agencies out there, but I felt they were more hungry because they had, you know, a lot of ideas, a lot of fresh ideas, a lot of plans in place that they wanted to do to help me promote this album, which I thought was great. But then I was approached by one of the bigger name companies and it was the PR company that worked with, um, or they work with Cradle of Filth and the singer from him and, um, there's a band Crypta, you know, the um, yeah, Brazilian girl, the girl group. Yeah. yeah. So I'm like, wow, these guys, you know, want to work with me. That's great. And I signed on with them and it was, it was expensive. It was two grand a month <laughs> compared to the four grand. So I'm like, wow, this is going to be, you know, worth every penny. This is great. And it was just like crickets, man. You could, it was one of the worst PR experiences I had ever had because they were great people. Don't get me wrong. They were very nice, very polite. And I don't know if their workload was, I don't know what was going on there. There was definitely some stuff going on internally. You could tell because I would send out emails saying, uh, you know, Halloween's coming up. My band is centered around Halloween. Hmm. How about we do this, this, and this, reach out to these outlets and try and capitalize on that season and get some good press out of that. Didn't hear anything back for like a week, no response, nothing. So I'm like, okay, we'll let it sit. And then another week went by and it's like for two grand a month, you would think you'd get a you know response, not getting anything. And I had released a music video in October and I asked him, I said, are we going to push this anywhere or give like an exclusive to a site or something? And he said, no, this is uh, just a conversation piece we'll use later on. Don't worry about promoting it right now. Gosh. And I'm like, huh? All right. Well, I did all that work and seemingly for nothing, where's this money going? And eventually it fell so flat that I had to cut ties with them because there was no, there was no give and take, you know, it was all me coming up with these ideas wasn't getting anything in return and they had apologized. They said, you know, there's some stuff going on with our, our, um, the guy who runs the company, um, was going through some stuff and I don't know. So I cut ties with them and started trying to do the PR myself hmm. and just reaching out to outlets personally. And it was like a night and day difference. I was getting responses like that. People yeah. were enthused. They were sharing my stuff. I was getting playlists on uh, Spotify, Apple Music, all sorts of stuff. So I'm not sure if it's just my experience, if you have anything to weigh in on. But from what I gained is that if you put more time and effort yourself as a musician into that, instead of trying to hand that off to somebody else, you're probably going to get a better, more personalized result. Yeah, I concur. And and your experience it's hard one experience from the perspective that you've got to go through that in order to understand what the PR companies can be like. It's not yeah. like you can guess what's going to happen and save you $2,000 or your $4,000 if you do it over two months or what have you. I've yeah. only I've only used one, which is uh, Metal Devastation PR for my book. So Zach Moonshine, and I know Zach, so he was that was fine. You know, he, okay. I, paid my, I, I paid, I think it was the equivalent of 100 bucks or what have you, and Oh, he wow. did a couple of email blasts for me and that was it. But that's I, I got what I paid for. So there's no issue there. I uh, I studied uh, social media marketing at university and understood very early on that if you aren't putting money into social media, you're not going to get seen, mm -hmm. even by yeah. your followers. So that $2,000 you pay, if they don't have some sort of uh, a strategy where they can plug into building your – Allow helping you reach networks that you otherwise wouldn't reach because you don't have you, that two thousand dollars should go onto an accumulative budget if you like, and then they exactly the they should have the networks that they're sending your music out to people that otherwise wouldn't hear you. That's the whole point of it. And mm -hmm. um, yeah, I, I uh, especially with the podcast, I do zero duck egg on the advertising or PR because I just don't want to. But those moments where I've gone into my contemplation and thought, how do I grow the show? Yep. It all comes down to doing a very good ad, putting it on Instagram, making a reel, doing all that stuff. And you, there are so many great YouTube clips out there these days that show you how to do this stuff yourself. I'd go down that route. But the bottom line is I'm just so busy with 
everything. So oh, yeah. <laughs> work, playing in bands, first and foremost, the family and the podcasts and I'm writing a, oh, we'll get to this in the afterwards, but I'm writing a book for a black metal musician, Norwegian black metal musician, his biography. So that's happening. Oh, nice. I, I've just had to step out of an, another band that I was working in. So I just don't, if I was to do a blast and get some good responses, I don't think I could handle getting back to people and the momentum that I did carry it would just stop in a, in a heartbeat. Yeah. But for you, it's different, man. I mean, you've got this killer release, no doubt, that's coming out and you want people to hear it. So a PR yeah. company has got to get behind you and do what you're actually paying them to do. And it was originally the contract was for, let's see, October, November, December, and January. And that, that's why I cut the cord because I'm like, I'm not paying this much for, you know, no results here. And like you said, that money would have been better spent and has been better spent pushing into social media and, and you know, stuff like that. Mm. for advertising and trying to get um because it is it's pay to play these days i remember back when i was on facebook a long time ago and i had like i don't know it was like 30 40 000 followers my content was seen the moment i posted it it was yeah. seen read by everybody and then everything changed and it became pay to play and i was getting like zero views and zero hits on my stuff unless i paid to have it seen yeah it's pretty pretty evil when you think about it. Yeah. They're a utility. You have to use social media. If you want to Absolutely. get your material out, I get that there are these photocopied Xeroxed fanzines that are out there that are issued by some bloke in Czech, Czech Republic in his in his uh, parents' basement. I understand that there are those things and they're very cult, you know, KVLT, <laughs> you know. I, I get yeah. all of that, but that's not what you and I are about. We actually want our stuff to be heard. And if you go to the effort of paying for it, it's – bit of morality, bit of deontological morals sort of must kick in at that point from the perspective that you got a job to do, guys, so get on with it. And whatever yeah. issues are going on, maybe you need to refund the money or if you've got some issues where you weren't able to, to do the job. But it's all it's all part of the the rich tapestry of being a musician in my experience. As I mentioned I, I just stepped out of a band, or well, half stepped out, I should probably say, but... I can't commit to regular rehearsals because I'm just too flat out. But the bloke, Altian, he was Altian Child. So people in Australia will know who he is uh, because he won X Factor. Did X Factor appear in this? Oh, okay. Well, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yep. Won X Factor in 2010. So a while ago now. But I knew him from beforehand because he was a pretty full, he's always been a full on muso. But the stories that he's got stories for days about being ripped off 50 oh, grand wow. here, 10 grand there. Oh. And just the way he was ripped off, particularly in, in the United States by people promising the world and you get over there and they've ghosted you or even worse, yeah. they try to blame you for things falling apart or what have you. And <laughs> that just seems to be the the standard experience for a lot. You you've, you know that I've spoken to all of the Cradle guys about what's going on in that band and I've had a of ripper of a conversation recently with Lindsay that I really hope sees light of day because it goes even deeper. Mm. the business front and, and was that after the sarah chat yes oh, yeah, okay it was through the sarah chat that i was able to that 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 door opened oh well so it's up to Lindsay. I, I as you know you know me well enough mate now i don't put any pressure on anybody and also to i'm a vault whatever they share with me doesn't get out there yeah and uh i've just left it with her and whenever she decides it goes out it goes out and if it doesn't it doesn't but that even goes even further than the conversations with uh, Nick mm. about things without yeah. giving too much away. And uh, you don't have to be a brain surgeon to look at a band that has the turnover that that band has <laughs> to understand that there's no. issues around finances. It's only an idiot would simply say it's not to do with that. It's about the art. Yeah. No, that's a load of uh, <laughs> bollocks, as they say. We're uh, – we're, all these musicians are in their 30s, 40s, and 50s. I mean, how do the hell do people think that they pay for things, you know, out of thin air? I know. Oranges. <laughs> I know. It's crazy. I was just talking to a buddy of mine about um, when I mentioned, you know, Facebook and having that many followers and getting your content seen. And at that time, that was when I could actually make money off of music, believe it or not. I sound like an old man now, but back in those days, which wasn't too far back, this was like, you know, I don't know, 2007, 2008. 
And I was making a good chunk of change off of just selling my music. And it would literally come from me into the computer and then out into like iTunes and all these other areas. And then I would get a payment back in my PayPal account and it would be sizable compared to what it is now, which is just pennies. But Mm -hmm. I had actually landed a music video I did, got put on MTV. It was on MTV too, Headbangers Ball, when they were still running that tail end of it. Yeah. And that was just so cool because it was like, you know, home curated metal that made its way into that platform. And there was no in between. There was no PR company. It was just straight from me to them. But something changed where now everything there has to be this like this middleman that collects your money. And, you know, you have to pay to play, like I said. Do you remember those days? Sorry, I remember those days well because you always wanted to be published. And over here, Rage on ABC. And if you got your video played on on Rage, which was our it wasn't quite our version of MTV because it wasn't as pervasive. It just played on Friday and Saturday nights. But everybody, right. people would stay up and get drunk and stoned and watch it. Yeah, yeah. Shed load more eyes watching that than you do these days with some of the minor channels. Certainly the free-to-air channels are dead. As oh, yeah. Probably in the States as they are here in Australia. I don't know how they're how they're still yeah. copying companies to give them advertising money because who the hell's watching it? But getting published <laughs> like that, man, that's awesome. You can actually say, you can legitimately say you're an MTV artist. Yeah, but now nobody cares because nowadays, you know, you get maybe a half a second because everybody is viewing your stuff like this, flipping you by with their thumbs, and you're lucky if somebody stops on you long enough to, you know, check out what you're doing. But what it's worth, this has been my observation, okay, just with a, and I've stuck. This has not been my plan or strategy. I've stumbled over this, but in the last three to six months, I've been sharing more content on Instagram from the gigs that I've been going to because post COVID, we're getting mm-hmm. just magnificent bands. Like I saw Creator and In Flames on Sunday night. It's a weekly oh, wow. occurrence at the moment, though. They're just coming through town that often, and. I saw a band, an Australian band who I hadn't heard of. I oh, sorry, I'd heard of before, but didn't know much about them. Faceless Burial, a death metal band in the vein of cynic mm. and death in that very proggy, deathy way from Melbourne. Yeah. And they were up here. They were playing on a very small festival, built as a festival. I can't remember who the who the headliner was now. My apologies to the band, but they were they were from your part of the world. Great guys. They're from New England, I think. Great guys. So oh, cool. quick chat to them, but. I posted a video. I'll get, I'll get to the point now. <laughs> I, <laughs> I posted a video just of this guitarist from Faceless Burial playing, and it's got 2,000 views or something like that, just a 20-second clip. Yeah. Now, I've done curated content that hasn't even reached 100. <laughs> Isn't go that figure. funny? So go <laughs> figure. So m- maybe, maybe set it up so as though Joe Rogan was talking about it, that he keeps his show deliberately lo-fi. And yeah. just him talking to people without any of the explosions and all of the bullshit that all of the major, yeah. the old the old school majors used. But there's something in that because people, they react to things that are visceral in the moment because they feel like they're there, I believe. And sure. uh, I'm, I'm going to be posting at, where, where I can. I'm going to be posting where it's relevant, sorry. I'll be yeah. posting a lot more content like that because I can see that it helps the channel attract more people. And it's an easy yeah. way. To, yeah. That's a good point, too, because now that you mention it, when I'm looking in my head at like my social media feed, the posts that have the most engagement are the posts where either I'm talking to the camera or I'm playing a little lick or something, and it's not edited. It's not like you know, with the you know special effects or whatever, looking all polished and stuff. Hmm. It's more of like a real deal clip. And I think you're right. People like to relate to that because it feels like it's something that that's more visceral to them. As opposed to like, and this is a conversation I had with some of the PR companies was what type of artist do you want to promote yourself as? Do you want to be more like Tool was in the early 90s where they were so mysterious, you didn't even know what they looked like half the time Mm -hmm. versus a band like, I don't know, that's more in your face and sharing every little tidbit like, you know, what they had for breakfast and what they had, you know what they shat in the toilet the night before, you know, you know, everything about them. Oh, there's a lot of oversharing. We're going through that at the moment with Taylor Swift is in Australia with her, with her boyfriend, the American football player. Uh, Taylor, who I I haven't heard of her before. (laughs) I wish I had it, mate, believe me. She is, she is just, 
I remember as a kid when Michael Jackson came through in 91, two or three, one of those, you know, early 90s. And it seemed like everything stopped back then. But this is worse because of the pervasive social media coverage and reading yeah. reading that there was a forum from fans in Melbourne that were talking about wearing adult nap, we call them nappies, but diapers, adult <laughs> diapers to watch her show to not miss out on any bit. It's like, oh, wow. They, these people are mentally ill. Good There's Lord. Nothing. Yeah, and it's an entire industry. And then the M- the Melbourne Cricket Ground holds, at its capacity, holds something like 88,000 or something. I might be off by 10,000 either way, but a big mm. stadium, a bit like an NFL stadium in the States. And that was full for two or three nights in a row. And it's like, what is... That's a lot of piss. Yeah, it's a lot of piss. It's, <laughs> it's a lot of it's a what it's a lot of mental illness. <laughs> it's it's just I understand yeah, I kids mean. kids our, our kids' age getting into it, but adults getting caught up in this stuff and that worship of stardom. Because this Taylor Swift person, I'm sure she. I'm not saying she doesn't exist. She clearly is a a person, but it's all PR. It's all bullshit. All highly oh, curated. Sure. And at that yeah. level, that's what it has to be about. And my point in amongst all of that is, there's no point in us as artists or me as a podcaster, emulating what they're doing with all of this highly curated content because it appeals to a oh, yeah. for an audience. No, you're right. Spot on. <laughs> and if you, you think about like Michael Jackson back in the 90s like that, and you look at the crowds that, that went to see him, they're not just like cheering and clapping. They're like crying and breaking down and like passing out and stuff. And I'm not sure if Taylor has that type of fan base now i haven't seen it but you know those fans can get pretty rabid when those artists are pushed to that level mm. corn and marilyn manson were like that though do you remember that those days oh yeah yeah definitely yeah there was a show in sydney or melbourne where a young lady couldn't get into it was one of the two i'm sure it was marilyn manson though and she mm-hmm. cut her wrists oh god outside the show and uh i, I remember that i mean this is going back to 2000 and so 1997, 1998 days, earlier Good maybe, God. 96, I don't know, one of them anyway. The, the point is it was bef- before the internet became a, the behemoth that it is now. Yeah. But I haven't seen a lot of that, to your point about the reactions to Michael Jackson, I haven't seen a lot of that with the Taylor Swift thing, but I've seen a lot of I've seen a lot of commentary online and, and people sharing screenshots of messages and posts and some very weird mm. comments are being made. and. So my the agent that I work with very close close with here and is a good mate of mine, John. Um, he uh, he asked me who who would you be nervous about meeting and interviewing. I said I don't think anybody I, from, yeah. from Steve Harris in Iron Maiden. Oh, I wouldn't interview. You've done people. a lot of big names, so. Well, I wouldn't. I wouldn't. The, the bigger, the really upper echelon in a metal and rock sense, like Steve Harris, and I'd talk to Steve, but I wouldn't talk to Lars Ulrich. I wouldn't <laughs> talk to Dave Mustaine because I don't want to act as PR for them. Yeah, but that's because you know what their agenda is when they're sitting down to do that. Uh, it's uh, yeah, yeah. You get that with the younger ones too that they don't know how to have a conversation like you do, and yeah, that's why I don't know whether you've noticed. I don't do a lot of younger ones anymore. I'm just nah, I'm not doing it. It's too hard. It's I think PR. I'd like to have a staring contest with Dave Mustaine. I think he'd be good at that. Just uh, to stare at him and get those squinty eyes peering into your soul. See so who did can you, blink first. Man. Did you ever listen to my chat with uh, David Ellison? No, it was that post. Yeah, diddling. Uh, yeah, post controversy. Of stuff. Yeah, yeah. Oh um, man, how was that? Great. I said to David, it was a pleasure to talk to him because I've, I've had a number of chats with him, and I just said okay. it's like getting 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 the non company man version of you here. I feel like I'm getting the real the real Ellison here. And it was just such a joy to talk to him. It was like talking to you. It was, you could ask him questions that seemed, I'm I'm never, I I hope this comes across. I'm never aimed to be insensitive, but I want to get to the bottom of things when I have conversations. So that's what I think makes a show interesting because talking to Kyle Thomas, for example, from Exhorter, asking not about the Pantera thing, but why questions keep on coming up about it. Just a bit of a different mm. spin on a similar question that'll get a different, that'll, that'll actually try to get to the bottom of things rather than just get the same old reaction. And uh, that was true with Dave David Ellis and uh, was able to really hammer it, hammer down on the Dave Mustaine thing. And I think his comment after I asked him was just, 
I can't remember the question now, so I was going to make the point. Not redundant, but it's important that I remember it, but I can't. But I'll give you his answer, which was that to my question about Dave Mustaine, David Ellison said I he doesn't think David Dave Mustaine's ever enjoyed his career or himself in his career. And that to me told me everything. Mm. That the bloke is still that angry, angsty teenager underneath all of those layers. Brilliant guitarist, the architect of thrash metal, undisputed king of the genre, in my view. Just a god in that respect, but as a person, flawed. Well, it makes sense from my perspective because all I ever hear him complain about is Metallica. I hear him talk about Metallica more than he does his own band, and I don't know if that's because I'm not digging deep enough into Megadeth's uh, current, you know, whatever they're doing. But like the headlines I do see are always Dave Mustaine comments on, you know, James or Dave Mustaine comments on Lars or blah, blah, blah. So it seems like he's, he's pretty damn bitter about that band. That album risk was a reaction to a comment that Lars Ulrich made in guitar world. I believe I remember reading the article and then Dave confirmed I'm paraphrasing, but confirmed it to an, to an extent when he said that Lars said he wishes Dave would take more risks. There's the album <laughs> right there. Risk like destroying your career, making a middle of the road foreigner sounding record. Great, go for it. But I mean that album, as bad as load the load series of albums are, Risk is worse. Was Risk the one with that? Or was it Trust? Was the single off of that? That was okay. That was Cryptic Writings. So that was the album before. Oh, okay, okay. I thought I, I thought you. I thought he he'd, he'd managed to find a balance between him trying to get onto radio and still keeping it a bit thrashy, but risking yeah. it away with the thrashy stuff, and it was all it was it was pop, emo, adult oh, wow. rock, yeah, wow, unlistenable in my view. Well, speaking of the big four, Slayer, that's just in the news. What do you think about that? Yeah, I was going to bring that up, so I'm glad you have. Um, I think. My air conditioners decide to turn back on. God, Slayer's coming through the air conditioner. <laughs> That's the magic <laughs> just, word, Slayer. Oh, there you go. It's just decided to activate or something. And suddenly um, my tea has turned into wine, and I, I don't know what happened. Wow, I said Slayer. Slayer, yeah. I, look, I don't have an issue with any of it. I think you, you probably can guess my sentiments on it, uh, that the musicians can do what they've got to do because they've got to earn money. Okay? I was just so, going to say it's... There's... there's far more money in uh, breaking up and then coming back again and coming just to ask kiss <laughs> yeah there's there's a shed, shed load of money in going away for a while motley crew going away yeah. for a while and then coming back oh, yeah we, we've seen that with slayer i don't have a, a, a single problem with it at all as a fan uh, i probably won't i probably won't watch it but that's just me because I won't see Pantera either. I'm just, I, I didn't see them originally. I'm a bit of a purist in that way. Don't They can do whatever they want, but I'm a bit of a purist in that I only want to see, as I say, the real. So I want to see Stuart and Cradle of Filth and. Of course. And Trey. And, and I don't mind Steve in uh, Morbid Angel at all. Actually, I think he does a fantastic job, I've got to say. So Morbid Angel are a bit of a different beast. But uh, mm -hmm. with the bigger bands that a lot of our childhood, teenage memories are wrapped around. Yeah, it's Slayer can do whatever they want. Now, hopefully, they'll tour here and bring a bunch of bands with them. And uh, they'll. The, I, here's my prediction: they'll headline Not Fest next. There you go. Yeah, probably. They're not playing with Dave Lombardo, are they? Or Bostaff? Huh. Yeah, that's that's uh, interesting to say the least. I guess the yeah. thing that bugs me about the Pantera thing that you mentioned is like, I wasn't so perturbed by it until I saw him playing and I love, you know, each musician individually, whatever they're going to do their thing. But Zach, I was looking forward to seeing how he would play dimes parts. And I had heard that he was going to go out with dimes guitar tech and it was going to, he was going to use dimes amps, his guitars, mm. every, you know, pedal that dime used, he was going to use. And then he came out and it was the Zach wild sound, which is yeah. the chorus pedal and the pinch harmonics and then more pinch harmonics, and then why not throw even more pinch harmonics on top of pinch harmonics? And it was like, okay, so he's not going to replicate dime stuff. He's going to do his thing, which, you know, in one regard, I guess, is cool. But I was looking forward to the other other side of it. 
I, I question if if it's not that he's an extraordinarily capable guitarist. So it's not about ability. Oh, yeah. Emulating that sound is every every guitarist in a guitar shop thinks they can play walk, but it doesn't sound like dying. <laughs> <laughs> you know, you know no, you're, you're right. It's, it's two notes, but it doesn't sound like him. It's so weird. It's like it's. I'm not saying it's suggesting for a moment it's easy because it's not. It's very hard to do and get it right. As someone who's oh, sure. as you have done, hammered away for hundreds of hours in rehearsal rooms with bands, getting things mm-hmm. right takes. It's not even about practice. It's just about having magic in the air in the moment because there's a technical yeah. side of it, and then there's another unquantifiable, intangible side of things that has uh, only happens once. And I've said it before, mate, dime was lightning in a jar, never to be repeated. Oh, yeah. Only one. Absolutely. That's it. And, and I I suppose the fact that, that Zach is just being Zach and paying tribute, and I understand Phil came out early on and clarified that, that yes, they're going under the, the Pantera banner, but it's actually a tribute to the brothers. That's what mm-hmm. they So it's really Pantera, the tribute to the Abbott brothers. Yeah. And, Yes, they're cleaning up, making a lot of money. No, I hope the Abbott estate is making a lot of money as well from it and the fans that couldn't see them back in the day in, are, are getting their fill, but it's it's not something I'd go and see because I, uh, I, I prefer being in small clubs these days. Yeah, you know, we're uh, bitter old men these days. We don't need to bother with so. those big shows. I think so, yeah. I, I, <laughs> I feel the same way. I'll tell you, I'll just, I'll, I'll change subject because I want to tell you about my, um, and it, but it's related. I want to tell you about my experience in 70,000 tons of metal. Yeah, I've been waiting to hear that. So, so there wasn't, I, there was only one legacy band on there that I, that I met, Tigers of Pantang, great guys. Oh, wow. Really enjoyed catching up with them. All those interviews are available now and um, you'd bump into them in the corridor. It'd be very strange. You'd be in the, the queue to walk to a band and you'd have, uh, Lee Harrison from Monstrosity next year. It was, it was <laughs> me from Australia seeing all of these great musicians in one spot. It was a very big spin out. That's wasn't overwhelmed or overawed by anything, but it was just very, very strange to to see mm. people in the flesh as opposed to like you and I are talking now over video, yeah. which I'm used to. Who was the biggest uh, kind of starstruck moment if there was one walking around there when you saw oh, him and you were like, huh? Oh, it, it'd be it'd probably mean nothing to anybody else, but it was Lee, it was Lee Harrison, because I've just was loved, it really? Yeah, I've been a monstrosity fan, malevolent creation fan for for years, and Not they sure. were one of the monstrosity in particular. I'm wearing the t-shirt, funnily enough. This album, yeah. when I got that, it, it it wasn't one of those change everything albums, but it solidified everything for me that this is the music that I loved. That mm. technical, no bullshit, meat and potatoes, death metal. The guys turn up in black T-shirts and jeans, and that's what they do. And there's very little fanfare around it. Just get on stage and do your thing. And yeah. they they put on easily for me the set of the of the entire cruise as well. I was right up next to the. Oh wow! I got footage of the entire thing, and uh, unfortunately, because it was recorded with an iPhone, it's just blasting. Because I was watching, hearing. Being that close to monstrosity, it's like being in the middle of a jet engine. There's just white noise. <laughs> That's what wow. I felt like. And a couple of the people who I bumped into, I you know became friendly with in my walking around and stuff. Watched the show as well and said, "Yeah, that was that was that was up there or close wow. to in terms of the show." That it sounds was, intense. Oh, it was brilliant, man. He's got uh, the singer from Diabolic, I think, which was a band that Trevor Perez started back in the nineties. Oh, okay. So, and he's got Mark Van Erp, who was the bassist on Imperial Doom, mm. and the other two guys. He doesn't have the only disappointing factor is he doesn't have Mark English, who was the Deerside guitarist. Oh, the okay. Anymore. The other two guys did a tremendous job. Not about them doing a bad job, but I'm a huge Mark English fan. He's a wow. excellent technician. Um, yeah, no, definitely. So there was that. Um, there were on what I can say, there was no disappointing moments. There was, I wasn't drinking at all, as people need to know that. I was probably one of the only people that wasn't drinking because most of the people I met were well into their seventh or eighth beers. And that's great. I don't, I'm not <laughs> a, an evangelist. You go and lead your best life. I just can't drink anymore because yeah. I don't want to. Yeah. I don't want to do it anymore. I don't even feel the pressure to drink. I just don't care. I just get my Dr. Pepper or Coke and away I go. Yeah, there you go. And um, so I didn't. 
I did. I thought I'd miss it a little bit. Didn't at all. I was able to get into all of the bands. Unleashed were great. Sodom were fantastic. Hadn't seen them before. Wow. Very good meeting. So, Tom was great. How does that work with the stage and everything? Like, it's all out outdoors, I assume. Or there's five of them. The four of them. So there's oh wow pool deck which they were building when I got on the boat when we got on the boat. So that's the main. St- if you want to have a main stage, that might be it. I, I don't okay. know. But then they've got a three, two theaters, two oh, or wow. three theaters. Yeah, they have enough enough venues on the boat to ensure that music is being played from. I think it was started at ten thirty, right the way through to five thirty a.m. Wow, that's crazy. So yeah. would you say it's more like going into a small club, or is it like a bigger type of venue? Or depends which venue you went into. So mm. think of think of the boat as like a small town. That's exactly what okay. it feels like. It feels like a small town with everything in it that you could think of. Huh. And the venues are just, and the places you watch a band are just venues in this small town. It just happens to be on the boat. You barely notice any rocking around because the Caribbean at that time of the year is very, very calm. So wow. if, if anybody's prone to seasickness, they, in my opinion, they won't get it. I'm trying to convince my wife to come with me next year on it because she does get terrible motion sickness. Ugh. And she's very, uh, very concerned that by being on the boat, she's going to get it. But mm. I don't think I don't think she's got anything to worry about. I certainly barely noticed it. There's way more mm. motion associated with turbulence on an aeroplane. Oh, okay. And I knew all about that because that was 22, 22 or twenty three hour flight flight time in total to get to Miami from here. It was ridiculous. But it is. Oh. Ridiculous. And what happened? You got held up in Canada, was it or? No, oh, Miami coming what the back. What happened? I don't know. I was standing just by nature of circumstance. I was sitting next to the the desk next to the air bridge and yeah. all of the stewards and hostesses from Air Canada because I flew Air Canada were there and the, oh, okay. the uh, pilots were there too and the whole airport was locked down for a couple of hours. Hmm. And they weren't. the airport authority clearly wasn't giving anybody information because I could hear the pilots and the stewards talking. And I was saying, hmm. what are they doing? And the concern was, mate, was that my connecting flight had a two-hour window. And oh, thankfully, God. my connecting flight to Brisbane from Vancouver was delayed by an hour and a half. Otherwise, I would have <laughs> been sleeping on the airport floor, which I I, I loathe airports as much as I loathe hospitals. I just can't. They are necessary. Literally, the only two. I want to say necessary evil. They are evil. Mm. They're horrible airports. But Damn. I just I was travelled in and out. Dodged a bullet there. Yeah, when we when we got off, so they called out. We were landing in Vancouver, and there was four of us on the plane that were connecting to Brisbane. And they said, "Go now!" So we landed. Mm. They said, "Go now!" Everybody, let them get off because they've got to go. We ran and half half jogged or what have you to the departure lounge, which departure uh, gate, which wasn't too far away. Thank God, uh, didn't have to go through customs. Um, and the, they were lining up, and we got on. No dramas. Oh, wow. Just got on. Wow. As they, were, they were, you know, if I was, you know, section A, B, C, and D, and E, they do it like that. These yeah, days. Yeah. I think I think they'd already called the first two sections, and we just made it. And I was sweating, <laughs> sweating and stuff, and I sat down and for another 14 hours. <laughs> oh, there you man. go. So <laughs> hurry up and hurry up to hurry up and wait. Wow. And uh, I just didn't want to be stuck at an airport. And I, Canada's lovely, I'm sure. I've never, I, I still can say I've never been there because getting to the airport's hardly going to the country. Landed there. Yeah. But I didn't really feel like trying to find accommodation in Vancouver for however long it was going to take to get another flight back to Brisbane. Oh, yeah. Screw it. Because that. it was freezing there. I don't know whether it was as cold as where you are, but I felt it in the air bridge. It was way colder than sure. I anticipated. And I didn't have the clothes because. So yeah, you're not prepared. For that. I had issues in the states again because they couldn't understand me. Oh, really? With yeah. the accent? Correct. Huh. Yeah, and uh, it was mainly with people whose second second language was English. They were used to American English, not Australian English. Yeah. So I had I, I just you. distinctly recall in Miami in a in a burger joint a young lady who was originally from Argentina. She said, "I'm so sorry. I had no idea what you were saying." <laughs> So I it was I learned in the Philippines, I've learned that too. I had to sort of talk like this a bit. And I had That's to adopt weird. that. 
that Filipino accent, I call <laughs> it, for her, so, so I could order the burger and the Coke. And <laughs> it's <laughs> it's uh, it's rare, but it's interesting when it happens. And occasionally I could see but some people had no idea. Obviously, I'm a white bloke, white Anglo Celtic, and I think they think I'm going to sound like you. And then I open my mouth and I sound like me, and they're yeah. like, "What the hell's that?" <laughs> you know, so, <laughs> so, and Miami, if you don't know, is predominantly Spanish speaking as the first language. Yeah, of course. I and was, plus, most Americans' knowledge of Australia is limited to Steve Irwin and Crocodile Dundee. So, yeah. Yeah. yeah, but I didn't. It was gone are the days where people find you really peculiar. That that twenty five years ago when you travelled to the states, it was you actually got sick of it after a period of time because they want the g'day mate and the, that's not a nice, <laughs> knife, all of that shit. And I don't think I got that <laughs> once over there. So <laughs> I don't think I got that that once because it's Crocodile Dundee was a big movie, but it was way bigger in the states than it was here. Was it really? Yeah, I mean, what about in, like? Um, Paul Hogan as a as a celebrity down there was he considered like you know big time? Oh yeah, but more it, it's, it's interesting. More of an American, funnily enough, because he lives there. So yeah, you know, he's the quintessential Aussie in some respects. I think he was not really considered clearly Australian, but not really one of ours. If that makes sense, his fame came from the okay. huge fame came in the US. So Australians are pretty peculiar that way. We've got tall poppy syndrome. So as soon as somebody succeeds abroad it's like yeah we decided we can have them. <laughs> how about steve Irwin? was he uh beloved down there or? oh there was a lot of cultural cringe around him yeah it was really lot, yeah yeah there's a lot of people even today that that probably misunderstand so St- steve steve was apparently what what you saw on the camera was what he was like in real life as well that's not an act yeah um and when I worked for Telstra, I used to look after Australia Zoo. It was my, the company I had to look after for the telecommunications business. I, I was a oh, okay. for. So I got to know some of the people and I'd see Bindi and um, what's her name, Terry and the other one. What's it? What's the kid's yeah. name? I can't remember the bloke's name. Yeah, son. Yeah, yeah. son. Because they'd come in and record stuff at the local radio station, but they, you know, they'd get out of the car and run in and they would mm. talk to babes like me. So, no, I, I don't know. I think it's... More of a tourist thing, to be honest with you. It's not really a, not really a thing that was. It was big here, but no, again, nowhere near as big as it was in the states. Okay, now number three, I'll give you a third one: silver chair. Well, that's an interesting question. That's a great question, actually, about silver chair. Um, yeah, a lot of cultural cringe. Uh, gradually being accepted. When I say gradual, like they've long, they they were gradually accepted. Initially, it was. They they had a huge success, but they seemed to appeal to like the Taylor Swift fans back then, the mm. teeny poppers or what have you. I personally still think Daniel Johns. I, I still I feel Daniel Johns is the most talented rock front man we have ever produced, even besting Michael Hutchins. Yeah, he's the real deal. But I think he's I think I think he's a fuck up. Well, he's yeah, something wrong with him. <laughs> He puts his heart on his sleeve, that's for sure, and his music and stuff. And he, dri- he drives down opposite the opposite direction. Of, he drives into you know, oncoming traffic as well. Oh wow! And, and he's, he's had that. traffic accidents, and he's he's mixed drugs and alcohol, and he really doesn't. He's just to be honest, mate. He's the sort of bloke who needs God in his life. Some people do; they need that guiding mm-hmm. force to keep him on the straight and narrow, or something like yeah. that. Because without it, he seems to veer right off and. I, I've watched those those early videos from 94, 95, 96 when Frog Stomp was out and then Freak Show, I think it was the second one. Mm-hmm. Uh, Frog Stomp in particular when he looked like, sorry, two sex, mate. And yeah, he's he's the most talented rock front man we ever produced and he's he had a natural skill on guitar that I really haven't seen before or since. He has mm. a very the best like Muhammad Ali have a very light touch. They don't have to do much, and it just sounds enormous. Just mm. they what they yeah, do. Yeah, they sounded enormous. huge. Yeah, and they were a trio, and they were a trio. So they uh, Daniel, I had a recent. It's interesting you bring him up because I had a recent tweet interaction with him, Twitter interaction oh, wow. with him, where I used to write for a publication called Hot Metal, and mm-hmm. uh, there was a. Was it Destroy All Lines or one of those agencies in Australia put together a tribute to Silverchair? So North Lane and those sort of bands are on there. Those metal okay. sort of bands are on there. And 
I uh, I made the point that Daniel had long abandoned rock and metal. He's now an electronic artist or whatever the hell he's doing with a lot of symphony and stuff, and it all sounds like farting in a bathtub to me, but whatever. <laughs> um, he's entitled to do whatever he wants to do, but he has an enormous sure. talent that he's wasted, and the proof is in all these bands that he's inspired, and they were big names on this compilation. And mm. um, I, I wrote that in 2017, but it was then reposted last year, and it was rebroadcast, and, and Daniel... Really? Tagged in it by the publication, yeah, was re- was tagged in it by the publication, and I basically went to town on Daniel Lear, and I said, "You, you've wasted your talent. You can, you can come back, but hanging around the inner city suburbs of Sydney and talking to people who have no idea of your real talent, and, mm. and you know, or people who just the hangers on syndrome, because I think a lot of that happened yeah. to him too. And um, he, he said something like flattered, but I can't remember how he put it. He said something like um, simultaneously flattered but also abused or something. He said that. And I went, it is what it is, man. you got you got talent that I would die for from a musical perspective to have, but you just didn't use it. And occasionally you'll get people talk about Diorama and some of those later albums, but they're Mm -hmm. they're nothing compared to the rock stuff. Now, did they hit just as big as like – Nirvana did out here, let's say, with like Seattle being the scene. Did Silverchair come from a certain area of Australia that was considered a same type of like hot spot for music at the time? Or was it just um, like a one off type of thing? I'd, I'd like to. Newcastle is like an industrial city, a bit like Pittsburgh, I think. Okay. So steel and uh, mining, particularly mining, gotcha. a lot of mining going on around there. So it's very working class, but it's very beachy too, like a lot of the coastal cities in Australia are too. So it's like a Pittsburgh mm. by the sea, I suppose, but a bit smaller. So oh, okay. So you you had my point in, in and amongst that is that you had a lot of punk bands and hard rock bands, like the Screaming Jets come out of there too. So there was a small scene, but it was vibrant. And I wouldn't mm. say that they came from that. Maybe they were inspired by that, but they were 14 or something when that mm. when that first broke. So yeah. I think it was more to do with the fact that they just wanted to write songs and they were inspired by I just fin- I finished a book when I was in Japan recently, Daniel uh, uh, Ben uh, Ben Gillies and um, Chris Yono's book, and they were really inspired by Black Sabbath and Led Zeppelin. Oh well, yeah, it was was their key inspiration, and that's what they mm. loved, and that's what they wanted to emulate. And I can hear that. I can particularly hear the the Black Sabbath in the early album. Yeah, definitely. The, first one. I, I, the other issue too is that he didn't. Daniel is the type of bloke, and a lot of musicians are like this. So you're not you're not like this. You can work by yourself and get job, the job done. Daniel needs mm-hmm. a producer. Really? He doesn't – you can work with an engineer easily. He, I think he needs a producer to say, okay, you got all these ideas. Let's corral these Just ideas. Just guide him in the right. Yeah. Kevin yeah. Shirley did that. Oh, we, he did? Yeah. That was Kevin Yeah, Shirley. I know Kevin. Yeah, Kevin, Kevin Shirley actually – I'm not saying he's an excellent producer, always was, clearly, mm-hmm. but – what happened? This is the story behind that album, which has been confirmed by by Kevin. So he he more or less put that album together with Daniel and the, and the boys. It wouldn't have happened mm. if Kevin wasn't there. Iron Maiden, Steve Harris then heard that album and went, who the hell produced this? This is fantastic. They love that album. Oh, no they're, kidding. They're still working with Kevin, still working with Kevin almost 30 years later. Hmm. That's crazy. I didn't know that. Yeah, that's what happened. Yeah. And who is their drummer? Because I remember specifically one of the most vivid memories I have is their drummer always wore gloves. And I always loved that at the time when I was a teenager watching that as a drummer at the time, too. Yeah, that Ben was pretty Gillies. cool. Yeah, Ben Gillies. Ben Gillies, yeah. yeah. And is he still connected to uh, Daniel at all? Or? No, nah, they fought at a, I wouldn't even, after reading the book, it sounds like it's done. It's, it's, that's it. Okay. It's, they've tried to, Daniel bass probably, player too. Yeah, yeah. Well, the bass player, there was a program, it might have been Australian story. It was one of them anyway, but it actually went into the behind the scenes behind the book. And it turns out Chris has had uh very serious cancer issues and tumors and oh, stuff. He's been very sick, man. And oh. he's just lucky to be alive. But we didn't nobody heard anything about it because he's not a limelight seeker. Yeah. So yeah. Silverchair, I I don't believe will ever come back. Remains to be seen. I there would be millions upon millions of dollars waiting for them if they decided to do it. Oh, sure. But Daniel's head is not in the right spot. I think Ben Gillies would do it in a heartbeat, the drummer, to your point. Mm-hmm. 
So he was really the yeah. heartbeat of that band. Daniel's the soul, but the heartbeat was was Ben Gillies. Yeah. I've I'm got terrible to say with this. I'm, I'm saying all of this and I sound like I'm a fan and I'm not really. I just find them interesting. Yeah, I hear you. It's the same way with like um, anathema. Is oh, that how you pronounce it? I called them anathema for years and then somebody told me it's anathema. I'm like, same. really? Yeah, exactly the same for me. Yeah. So they stopped making music. They were, I was into them when they were like, you know, I don't know what you'd call them, doom metal or they did more of the growly vocals. Yeah. And then they got into like the Pink Floydy type of clean singing, whatever. But they had like, you know, a pretty massive following at that point. And then everything just stopped and COVID hit and they disappeared and they started. I don't know if you followed them on social media, but it was pretty depressing watching them kind of like slide down to where they were like doing cover songs. And I, I think they were asking for money while they were doing these cover songs to try and like pay for something, some sort of bills they had with the studio or whatever. But it was sad seeing this band that like they have a, a live show they do, um, which is on YouTube. And I have the DVD of it. It's called Universal, I believe. And they play in one of those big like um, it almost looks like Red Rocks, the amphitheater oh, nice. to all these people. And it was just, it's just a beautiful concert. It sounds it's mixed perfectly. And it's one of the few concerts I go back to every year. But now I'm watching this band like almost grift for money on Instagram. And then they just completely disappeared. And I don't know what the hell happened to them. If it was feuding with the two brothers or what. But, you know, that's another band that, you know, there's a lot of money and a lot of fans waiting for them if they were to get back together. But I don't see it happening. I'm prepared to say that. Judgment and Eternity are some of the great two of the greatest albums ever written. And I'm a, yeah. I, you, you asked me earlier what I spent my time doing. In addition, on the plane, in addition to um, writing the book, I was listening to Judgment and Eternity. I, I've, I'd saved mm. them from Spotify. And oh, yeah. I think start to beginning, start to, from the very beginning to the end, they're both perfect albums. Not a no. Yeah, I agree. Place. I, I, yeah. Well, 34 is okay, but. Judgment is just a magnum opus. It's it's like a, it's probably the last great album produced by bands in that UK scene. You know that the Prince of Spawn, Cradle, My Dying oh, sure. Light, Carcass, all yeah. of those bands. That, that brilliant British scene that just yeah. produced all of these bands that we all just love. And and that was it. And it was Judgment. It was sort of I love the album cover. Everything. It's a big quasar exploding, I think, or something. And. Mm-hmm. It, it, to me, it signifies it's the end of something and the birth of something else. And the album is just brilliant, man. It's it sends shivers down my spine. Both of them do. And I was really privileged years ago, five or six years ago, to talk to uh, it's Vincent, isn't it? Vincent's the guitar, yeah. and yep. really got into things with him. And uh, there's a lot. Even back then, it was probably the first episode where. He asked me, he said, let's just keep this chat between ourselves. So out of an hour chat, I can only release 15 minutes or so. Uh, he went right into some things with me. And uh, it yeah. was it was the first conversation that I remember having with somebody and thinking, that's where I want the podcast to go. That's where it's going. This was before mm. I spoke to Stuart. Oh, interesting. Yeah. So there you go. So there was, there was that. And... Uh, yeah, anathema. I'm really glad you bring them up because people don't aren't aware of them as much. And yeah, they're, they're fantastic. Call them sellouts and all sorts of stuff, but they just did what they wanted to do, regardless of what was going on. And if anybody questions their brilliance, go and have a listen properly to Eternity and to Judgment, and tell me that you disagree. Oh, sure. If you disagree after listening to both properly, so be it. But I doubt it. They're one of the few bands that I could tell a friend that's younger than me to go check out and they'll love it. And I've also told like my father who's in his seventies to check him out and he doesn't really listen to that stuff. And he loved them too. They're very, very universal. Funny enough. Um, Mm. They're a very adaptable band when it comes to like, you know, people's personal tastes and stuff. They have a very broad audience. It's sad what you you mentioned there. I, I, I think I do follow them on socials, but of course, unless you're following all of their posts, you don't see all of their posts. Yeah. And uh, I didn't see that, but that's that's terrible for them because they are way better than asking nobodies for money on bloody social media. Yeah. They are, are brilliant musicians, those guys. Excellent. Outstanding. Yeah. 
And it was strange because I think it almost felt like a different bro brother was posting at a different time on Instagram. And then another brother would post something else that was the complete opposite of the last post. And then there was something about like splitting the name up and doing like an, an anathema light type of project or something where they, one of the brothers was going to go off and do something. And it just seemed so messy and it's a shame because they deserve so much more. If you ask me, I mean, they're on the upper echelon of bands that I consider to be, you know, perfect. Yeah. They might, they must, from a conversation with Vincent that yes, there are, when I say personal issues, they, they're very sensitive to these guys. That's why the music is so yeah. good. So they must feel everything. It's a shame, and I'll I regret it to this day since they've broken up. But um, I went and interviewed the guys from a band called Don Brocco, who were on a subsidiary label to Nuclear Blast. What's mm -hmm. that called? Uh, I can't remember the label now, but they were playing in Brisbane, and uh, Anathema were playing the same night. So I interviewed Cy Delaney, the guitarist, and John, the agent, messaged me because Anathema are playing. I was just dead tired and said no, but. Mm. I don't know if it was going to be the last time they were in town. <laughs> yeah. I would have seen them in, in hindsight. You know, Damn. but that happens. There's been a few moments like that where I never saw Motorhead, didn't see Motorhead. Uh, mm. And uh, I distinctly remember they played on the Gold Coast. So I believe south of Brisbane. And uh, they played on the Gold Coast in 2010. And I remember looking at the ad going, nah, they'll come again. So yeah, damn. <laughs> these things happen, you know, you got to see them oh, when they're in town. <laughs> I know. If you could pick one band that you could go back and see any of them, who would it be in their prime? Let's say. Oh, I'd have to be cradled with Stuart by far. Really? Yeah. Cause I'm not saying I didn't appreciate it back then, but you just don't, you're kind of aware that you're watching something brilliant, but you're also not, see, I saw Ralph Santola. So that's a big tick on that one there. He was the other one. Yeah. But okay. I, I saw Stuart too, but I was young. Man, I was nineteen or something like that. And you just mm. you don't have the fully formed awareness at that age that you you do later on in life because you're just young. Yeah. It's just how it is. Mm -hmm. But seeing there's two reasons, well, three reasons, of course, and we've spoken about this before. But seeing the triumvirate of Nick, Bles, and Stu together is yeah. those three musicians. Magic happens, mm -hmm. and just to witness that again. In a, in a club and to be able to hear all the Stuart's lines and Les's, the uh, that very ethereal tone that he uses, he chooses to use with his effects and just the just the Colossus, the 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 Zeus of metal in in Nick Barker, just up there because yeah. that was a that was a that was his perfect band. Yeah, right. how's he doing by the way? Because he's been going through some shit lately, from what I hear. Oh, you look, I hear things, and I talk to people and. Apparently he's uh, look he's sick. There's no doubt, and I don't yeah. want to talk out of turn. But I uh, I know he he seems to be okay. He recently caught up with um, Hellhammer. He posted something on on Insta. I think it was like last week or the week before. So I haven't been oh, in touch okay. with the bloke personally in years. Um, but I think he's it, for all intents and purposes, it looks like he's doing a lot better and. We all oh, want him to be better so that we can get out there and do that thing, that that great thing that he does. He's just absolutely he's just one of those guys. And one of the things, one of the comments that, that this bloke that I'm doing the book for has made repeatedly when they were touring with Cradle, what he did was get a milk crate, turn it upside down and sit next to a couple of metres away, get you know, get permission from, from the tech and from Nick and just sit down and watch Nick, not the band. <laughs> That's oh, Nick. Oh, man, lucky Name bastard. Name another drummer you do that for. You do Damn. it like Pete Sandoval and Hellhammer and and yeah. um, and Nick, and, but Nick in particular is like a symphony of drums. Oh yeah, that's insane. Yeah, I've I've been watching some old footage of him play, and every time I watch him, it's like the same feeling I had when I was a teenager. Watch, I'm thinking like this is like a human octopus. How does somebody play that fast? Those fills and stuff. It's just insane. Even to this day, like. Cradle's drummer now, what's his name? Martin. Martel Martin. Martin. Yeah, something like that. Yeah, yeah. So I can't keep track. Um, <laughs> he's a great drummer. He plays, you know, he does his his job and all that. He's phenomenal, but it's not nobody's ever been the same. I mean, let's face it. When Nick left, it was like just people trying to imitate what Nick did and failing badly at that. Yeah, it's it's Nick is Nick. That's he's talk to any extreme metal enthusiast and say Nick, and there's only one. Yeah. So 
so that's that's what it comes down to is that he's become a brand in his own right. And that's why when you ask that question, I'm pretty quick to answer it because even though I'd seen them before, I, I think I would love to go back and watch another one. Close second would be watching In Flames when Jesper was at his absolute peak in like 1998. Oh, yeah. Yep. Watching Jesper because Jesper's – Jesper's the architect of a lot of this sweet S sound that we all take for granted these days that mm-hmm. isn't just about everything from, from metal core to death core to death metal bands doing it. I mean, that's all Jesper. Yeah, Very absolutely. Easy. He and Stuart made it just so important, so crucially important to the evolution of heavy metal that people don't don't understand, I, I think, how, how important his playing is and his songwriting as well. So, And recently had the opportunity to chat to him finally. So with very, Jesper, yeah, with Jesper for the show, yeah. Oh, okay. So it was Sounds it was opportunistic because I was speaking to the singer in Syrah, is his other band. Oh, and, that's right, yeah, yeah. And uh, he was Jesper was just there, and I had literally asked Jake the singer, I was, "Do you mind getting him?" And he got him, and ended up having an interface with him, and it was great because he just doesn't do interviews. Hmm. Doesn't occasionally, but just actually seeing him, and he he looks well, but he he still can't tour. Yeah, and yeah, he's been going through some stuff. Yeah, it's fucking alcohol. Yeah, it's yeah. it's some people can and some people can't, and it's a once it gets you, I've noticed with alcohol, it's got you. Yeah, because like he started up with what was it, Halo Effect, and it was like a fresh new start. It was going to be this great big thing, and then it just seemed like the same thing dragged him down again. Apparently, I heard someone. Did I read a comment or something? It was on 70,000 tons of metal that he relapsed or something. Now, I'm only saying mm-hmm. what I've read. I'm not saying this for a fact. So, But I can understand why, as someone who didn't drink at all on 70,000 tons of metal, that's you. it is never easier to get a beer in any place than it is on there. Mm, like, because they've got bloke people walking around with um, the carts, not the carts, but they're, like, you know, overalls, and they've got this, like, ice yeah, yeah. in front of them, and, and you walk into a venue, <laughs> it's just bang and... I don't even have a problem with that. I, no issue with that at all. It's some people, and no, there were no issues, no fights, no arguments. I didn't see anybody behaving like a dickhead on the boat, not even once. You know, oh, that's that, cool. So people could clearly handle their alcohol, but maybe people, some people like Jesper can handle their alcohol so well that it starts to affect them internally and yeah. they can't stop. Yeah. And, and to be honest, mate, I was like that through COVID too. It was very difficult to. That's mm. one of the things that expedited my giving up alcohol was just the consumption through COVID. Oh, sure. I've seen it firsthand. I had a one of my best friends years ago was like so bad with it where he couldn't go to work in the morning without drinking a bottle like this of vodka. Ugh. And that wasn't to get drunk. That was just to be normal, to operate at work. Yeah. And eventually he ended up having some issues. And long story short, he drank himself to death. And this guy was... He was like fit. He would work out all the time. You know, he was funny. He was always lively. And then like all of a sudden it turned on a dime. It was just like we went to go see him in the hospital and he was a shell of who he was. He was like super skinny and you could see his liver looked like a basketball. It had inflated so much that it was just like it looked like something out of a movie and he couldn't talk. He was just laying there in his bed. And we were wondering, you know, is he going to be all right? And then a week later, they said, we've got him in hospice. Uh, You need to go say goodbye to him. Went in, said goodbye to him. And then it was just, he's gone. And he's my age. And it was like, this is what? He was like 30 something when he passed. But just to see how powerful, like, something like alcohol could just take somebody who was so fit and lively and then all of a sudden just Mm. gone. It just shows you how intense that can be. Yep. Yeah, that's that's a sad story, mate. Yeah, especially for given given his age and he had his whole life ahead of him. It's um Oh yeah. Yeah, it's yeah, alcohol. I, I I've had a very I've got to be honest, mate, I've had a very positive relationship with alcohol. It's not my story isn't one of those ones where I, you know, beat my wife or fell down in the gutter and, you know, drove drunk driver. It's any of that bullshit cliche, yeah. you know. Because that's not yeah. what happens, by the way. What happens is you just start yeah, with most people like your mate, your health just starts deteriorating until you can't get it back. Yeah. That's what happens. Absolutely. Yeah, mm-hmm. All of the Hollywood stories are, are bullshit. It's not, you know, I, I don't think I know anybody firsthand that would get behind the wheel drunk or yeah. or, or would beat their wife or any of that 
horse shit that is carried mm-hmm. on. That if you drink out, like you know, the gateway to domestic violence is alcohol. Oh, I know. It's a load of shit. It's it's a social lubricant. I met my wife at a bar, even though we worked together, we actually got to know each other by going to a bar. It's had a very positive influence in my life in that way. So there's no point in mm-hmm. in saying any other way. But I, I believe you've just got to know when the point is to that's it. That's yeah. it done. Because where the cutoff the, is. Yeah, where the cutoff is. And I know for me it's it's now. And I could feel that. And I knew it was coming too. And I knew it was coming and COVID just expedited it and yeah, so I could get bloated, and the hangovers would last three days. Ugh. Yeah, that's the older you get, those hangovers get brutal, man. They're horrible, and and the reason I talk about it is because I think a lot of people are in that boat too. That's the only yeah. believe me, I'm not talking about it because I'm really keen to share a story. You know, I've talked about it with the inflamed drummer and stuff. I I got off it by taking ayahuasca and mushrooms. Mm. Okay, by going journey. And that's the only way I was able to do it. And that's why I was able to stop cold because ayahuasca will put the counsellors and the psychiatrists out there out of business overnight because it's like 10, 10 to 20 years of therapy in one session. And what it, oh, wow. what it changes stays changed. It's, wow. like, it's, bio, it's bioengineering. Huh. So for those people that are looking to make changes in their life, whether it's through addictions or there are those people who, let's pick on the Taylor Swift fans again, those people who are addicted to, those people who go to, you know, the, the, they're addicted to stardom, the idea of oh, yeah. you can sure. You can cure almost anything through ayahuasca. That's what it's for. Hmm. It's not recreational at all. It's far from it. God help you if you use it for so it's therapeutic. Yeah. Correct. Yeah. And, and people need to be aware that this is an option for you and you're not going to find an answer through traditional method like when i say traditional methods modern western methods yeah it's really way hard. older way older that's the sad thing about out here i don't know how it is down there but if you go into a doctor's office out here and you say i'm depressed or i'm sad or you know i'm drinking the first thing they're going to do is offer you pills and write you a prescription and that's before they'll even ask what's wrong they'll give you you know three different bottles of pills and say here take these it's not quite – I know in the U.S. it's a lot like that because of the funding that goes toward mainstream media giants. I, mm-hmm. I get that. Yeah. Um, and it's um, it's it's not good at all that it's it's at that point. But in Australia, it's it's really hard to go, go on to antidepressants and um, medicines for uh, ADHD and all of that stuff. It's mm. – you have to go through a lot of checks and balances. We, we just have a much rig, more rigorous regulatory environment around it. Oh, okay. wow. You could that, but but what that then does? So it's positive. There's a yin to the yang. Okay, it forces mm-hmm. people to get what they want from other sources, black market sources, and you can get anything you want yeah. on the these days. And often you don't yeah. know what you're getting, which is why fentanyl's starting to creep into Australia. Oh man! So it's yeah. and, and as you know, fentanyl is causing massive issues across parts of the United States. Of course, yeah. And uh, we're they're trying to keep it out of here, but it's with the North Korean and and Chinese governments producing it it's very difficult to and and the cartels the mexican cartels also have big reach into australia these days too mm. so apparently it's very easy to transport and i don't know if people if people are determined to get off their face on something mate these days they can do it there's nothing that will stop you it's oh, all sure. to you yeah you know it's strange but, for me to see too because i grew up doing a lot of that stuff, experimenting with, you know, pot and acid and all that. And it never was an issue for me. I was able to stop, thankfully, and just, you know, cut it out. But nowadays, like back then, it was tough to get all that stuff. You couldn't find, you know, weed anywhere. It, you had to like call the right person and wait a couple of days if they had something and maybe you'd get it, maybe you wouldn't. Nowadays, you can go right down the street and buy it at a store across from the grocery store. Mm. And just come home with it. It's crazy. It's like you know, you yeah. want to, you want some pills, go to the doctor. You want some weed, go to the store. Mm. It's, it's entirely up to the individual now. It's whatever life you want to lead. It's basically yeah. for you. I, you have to. It's it's a, it's a it's the journey is a paradox though because often to give up alcohol you have to get so deep into it that you know you you know it's not for you anymore. And then you get yeah. out, and, and then yep. you done. You know you're done. Then you know you're done. There's no sort of half in half out. You have to fully, fully commit yourself to. It's not a mistake or anything. It's fully commit yourself to 
this process of getting through it, but you've got to go through it. And I know I did that. And uh, so, yeah. How does the ayahuasca work? Like, walk me through that. Like, how did you figure out that was going to be your your channel to get through it? And how did you go about, you know, approaching that? So I'd always been curious about it because this is before Joe Rogan started having people on Ter- Dennis McKenna, I think Terrence McKenna and these people talking about that and mushrooms and always been really curious about the um, the healing aspects, properties of it, not the mm-hmm. get off your face aspects of it. that. That does not interest me in the slightest. Um, I, um, I thought, well, I'm going to be open to this if ever an opportunity comes up and an opportunity came up. Mm-hmm. Well, I'll, I'll give it a go. And I knew I knew straight away I wanted to give up alcohol. I've been wanting to give up alcohol for a couple of years. And again, there's no problems. I just knew for me, for my overall health, I didn't want to wake up with hangovers anymore and the regret of, you know, spending $70 on a bottle of vodka and all the bullshit. Yeah. And that's really what it came down to and just feeling terrible because physically mm-hmm. terrible, mentally okay, but physically like shit, deflated, looking bloated, all that stuff. So I wanted to give it up. So you've got to be very intentional with ayahuasca, your mentor. And I I, I journey with a, shama, a shaman, a shamanic, through a shamanic circle. It's not, it's in a proper environment. Oh, cool. So um, I uh, we were told as a group of you first times, you have to be very intentional with this. Okay. It's not one of those things you just sort of slip into and, oh, it's nice. You can do that, but you've got to be very experienced because anything can happen because you're entering mm-hmm. into a DMT reality, which is you're opening a door. So you're going into another you're going into another realm which absolutely exists because you see the same things that other people see. It's very strange, mate. It, it's like the veil is lifted between this world and the next world. Mm. And the first night was re- was really rough. Like it's very tough, man. It's not. It's it's almost scary, it's, or was it no, just it's intense? Not scary. It's. Because I have a, it's again a lot of this stuff to people who haven't, who aren't open to it, is going to sound like bullshit. And I appreciate that, but yeah. it is. So my spirit guide appears and says, "This is what's going. This is what happens. This is what's mm-hmm. going to happen. It's going to be very tough at times, but it's going to be very rewarding. Um, but you have to tell us what you want. You got to tell us what you want from this. And of course, the first thing I said was that I didn't want to drink alcohol anymore. I was done." So he goes, okay, so that's what you want to do. Okay, let's go about that process. And then you fall into a hole and it's like you've entered hell. Damn. And you feel like throwing up, but you can't throw up. (laughs) Um, Your body heats up massively. I was sweating and it's like I did this, my first one in winter. So um, they were sweating a lot and – I just wanted it to end then and there, but I was, I, it was very weird, man. It's like the worst experience you can, the worst thing you can feel, but at the same time you feel very secure and safe. So again, mm. and it's an wrote, interesting dichotomy. Yeah. I, I look, I wrote it out and it was clearly clearing the way for me to be able to give up alcohol. And then I do a lot of walking. So I was just walking around and then the spirit guide said, look, you know, when you we're we're doing surgery here and, you know, do you do surgery on somebody who's walking around or somebody who's lying on an operating table? So why don't you go and lie down? And again, mm. this is what's being fed to me. So I'm going, okay, I'll lie down. <laughs> now, was your spirit guide, was it Paul Hogan? No, <laughs> it was somebody else from the movies. I don't mind sharing this. It was, it was you and McGregor. It is you and McGregor's Obi Wan Kenobi. And I don't was even really? like Star Wars. I don't even like Star Wars. Huh. But well, at least it wasn't Taylor Swift. No. No, and and he he explained you and you and Obi Wan explained to me what was happening, and so then then I lay down, and you go into a very deeper realm where you actually see the entities, and um, it's still very uncomfortable, but it starts to get a little bit easier, and then it starts to wear off because mm. it wears off after a few hours, five or six hours, or four hours, or what have you, depending on the dosage. And um, coming out of it, man, I remember sitting up, and you can barely, you don't have your senses, but. Yeah. Do you know what it was like turning off a plasma TV where all of those lines used to appear, rainbow colored lines? Yeah. Like, I sat, sat yeah. up, that's all I could see. So I'm coming out of this DMT reality huh. and I could just see this stuff and it was beautiful and these little lights and lines and stuff. And what I noticed straight away, as soon as I was able to sit down and eat something, because they put on this really nice vegetarian meal for us, and my cognitive functions were just bang, they were right there. 
Like really, everything that I wanted to say as it uh, as it articulated in my mind, my mouth said it. And, Interesting. And and I was like, wow, this is healing. This is. I knew straight away I was I was being healed. Wow. Um, the second night, so you do it two nights, and the second night I didn't um, take as much because I was a bit scared to be honest with you because it's understandable and um, it was more of a homecoming, like. It was a spirit guide appearing saying you've done a really good job. We understand it was tough. Um, you know, you're so gonna it felt necessary almost. Completely necessary. It was doing ayahuasca was one of the most normal things I've ever done. It's like parenthood, tough, huh. incredibly rewarding. You know what I mean? You get me. That's so very cool. I um the second night was very rewarding and there's a lot of tears and stuff. You just go through like a lot of it. You become yes. so grateful for your station in life. Just you you just you 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 step into the love that you have for your kids. It's really, really powerful, man. Mm. You step That's into intense. the love and you feel the love that you have for your wife and about the life that you've created together, like the tangible life that you've built together. And no. um but within a week I was back drinking and I thought, okay, fuck, you know, I thought it was gonna work. And then a couple of months went by and I couldn't go to the next one because I was because I was I was playing. It was so so you sort of got to trust the process, meaning that ayahuasca, they call her the goddess, the high priestess, the mother. The mm-hmm. mother choose when it's right for you. So had to wait. And maybe four months later I went into the second one. The second one is when the penny dropped. And when it was that first that the first night, um I'm trying to think. The first night I like apparently it was the brew wasn't that strong. So I had a lot of fun with ayahuasca. I had the fun experience that I hear so much about. Like I was interacting with the entities that look like caricatures with clarinets for noses and they're doing this sort of stuff back at me and I'm sort of wandering around them and stuff and they're winking at me. That's and wild. Really, yeah, and I see the pyramids and all of the light behind the pyramids and stuff and I'm walking into a like a like a a sunset with with all these beautiful cactuses around me. <laughs> this is just boring. Good God. And all these these fractals are happening at the same time. It was your typical DMT trip, you know, that you hear that yeah. people talk about the recreational side of it. And I woke up and I felt pretty good. You know, I was like, wow, that was a lot of fun. I wonder what tonight's going to be like. And the shaman made a stronger brew, but I didn't know that. So I'd microdose through the day anyway. And um yeah, it's um as soon as I drank this brew the second the second night of the second round, I um I it felt stop here. Like it, it mm. went clearly drank it, but I felt it stop here. And um yeah, it, like <laughs> you'll relate to this. I started to see really demonic versions of Iron Maiden's Eddie. <laughs> <laughs> they were just appearing like this guy, like like leaning going, yeah, like, yeah, oh, like, man. That. like this thing. I'm going, I don't fucking like this at all. Where are we going with this? This is not what I've this is what I remember saying to the mother, like, I haven't agreed to this. This yeah. is not if you're giving me the classic bad trip, I'm I'm no, nah, I'm out. No. Because <laughs> I don't want to lose my fucking mind. And um yeah. and then that went away and the fractals started coming in. And that's when you know you're under, and that's that's when my Obi-Wan appeared and he said, Rightio, tonight's a night. You know, like it's gonna be very, very, very tough, but I'm here mm. with you. And he explained to me exactly what was gonna happen. <laughs> it's gonna come in waves and I'm here with you. Um, it's going to be very tough, though. So here we go. And fucking hell, man. I mean, it's very difficult to articulate how I felt then, but if you could put yourself between the anvil of of um, grief, sorrow, abandonment, loneliness, that's where I was. Ugh. In this- so you were just getting hammered with emotion at that point. Not it's it's deeper than that. I don't know how else to describe it. It's like your spirit is being reformed. Yeah. So okay. so it's it's yeah, you feel what you're feeling, but it's fucking horrible. And but at the same time, you know you've got to go through it. And it's almost you, like purging, like vomiting your soul or something almost. It sounds what like. I saw what I saw was like a rock that was like that looked like a sponge that was being wrung and all this pus and blood was coming out. Ugh. So I saw all of this stuff and then um and then I I was just like, so about three or four waves came through and I remember just going to the ground going, I just saying to you and Obi-Wan, just like, I can't fight. This is ridiculous. This is like killing. Mm. What? Why do I, I mean, what? can't there be another way that we can do this where I don't have to go through this? 
because you're quite rational too. Your, your rational frontal lobe or what have you is still there. You're not. It's not like being drunk. Yeah, you're it's interesting because you're not like and out of it. You're you're thinking clearly, but yeah. And then so that went on for a couple of hours, right? So just and then this lady who had recently been separated from her adult son and grandchildren was just screaming and. Hmm. To like not in my DMT reality, but in the real reality, in the room. And when I say screaming, she was in a lot of pain, a lot of hurt. She's saying that she couldn't breathe, and she needed a lot of help from the guides, from the assistants. And I started fucking going into her reality, and I said, "No, no, no!" I was like holding on. Yeah. I was like, "I'm not. I can't go into that. That's horror. Like oh, I could man. feel her grief, man. It was fucking like it was gut wrenching. It was just." the worst feeling I've ever felt. And it was her wow. feeling. I could feel oh. what she felt. And I had said to one of the guides, I said, I grabbed her. I said, I just said, I can't stay here. I will get sucked into that. I, I don't, I won't survive that. You know, it's too much. It's too, I'm too close to that flame. So she, mm. I went, I went to this pasture area, but it was, it was fucking wet and stuff. But anyway, I knew I had to be there and I could hear her calming down a little bit. And then I, my, my journey still was going on. I was still in this, this horrible state, and it it lasted, man. It lasted about three hours, I suppose, all told, from piecing it together on on in retrospect. But then I was able to, at some point, I was able to say to myself, "You have to go and lie down." I spoke to the counselor there and said, "I'm really not enjoying this. I don't know how. I want this. It's not that I want it to stop, but I want this feeling to stop because it's hammering mm. me." And. When you're in that state, you don't think anybody can understand you. They can understand you clearly, but you just want it to stop. So yeah. So anyway, I, I spoke to her a bit. That helped talking to her, and you know, a lot of stuff from a lot of stuff from childhood comes up too. It's fucked up, man. Stuff yeah, basically sponsors you to feel the way you feel. Like the underlying causes starts man, like appearing, and Damn. and you you've got to step into it and try to you it re, well, the the beauty of I'll just rewind for a moment, go back to the first trip, the second night of the first journey. Um, mm -hmm. I was told by my guide that all all you have to do is be intentional and say what you want. The mother will put you on the frequency. So you don't have okay. to do the work. The work is just being here doing this. That's the work. So it's not it's like you have to go to counselling afterwards or anything like that. Like I remember yeah. – like that conversation happening basically. Just tell us what you want. We'll do it. But you've got to tell me. And, you know, it's coming. The time is coming. Now, tell us what you want. And okay. it's not to drink alcohol ever again. That was it. Because I figured that was the one thing I could change, really. that was. Hey, did you get a response immediately from that? or? Yeah, I did. Yeah, I, yeah, I, I have to mention this. So he's like, okay, great. Now we know. And then right on cue, because there's music playing, it started to be really upbeat music. I don't know whether I just noticed it was upbeat or what have you, but it started to be really upbeat mm. music. The endorphins started flowing and I started trying, crying tears of happiness and mm. he told me to do something and I swear to God this fucking happened. This is this actually happened. Like this is not just something that I can say was going on potentially just around me in my head. But um, but he said, you have to be rebaptized. Oh, wow. Well. And he said, pick your favourite beach and we'll arrange everything for you but you need to go there and you need to be rebaptized hmm. said okay so my favorite beach is probably miami miami we have a miami beach here too or north burley and um most beaches anywhere in the world in a sunny climate are just packed out on sundays right aren't they you can't get car spaces except for you know way away away and yeah. i um, i remember think, okay i trust you and he's like just trust us it'll everything will be pre-arranged go I kid you not, I drove to a beach. Like, I literally got a car park right outside of where you walk down to the beach. Like, it's mm -hmm. just unheard of. Like, you just don't get car spaces on Sundays at North Burley. All the Gold Coast, mm -hmm. if, if there are any, will we'll know what I'm talking about. And I was able to, to just walk out of the car, walk down to the beach. Um, you know, I could feel him talking to me still. I wasn't under the – but I could. it was the one time in lucid reality where he did come in and he goes, enjoy it. You've done the hard yards. Everything will be taken care of. That's oh, what wow. I said. And I thought, okay. And and it was it was it's not so much that I was disappointed that I was drinking by the end of that, but I just thought, okay, well, that's just that was a really lovely experience. And if I never do it again, at least I've got that and I can bank it. But the, wow. then fast forward to the second time, and that's that the second night of the second journey. And um the um 
once I got through the really was able to lie down, once I was able to lie down, man, then I started getting, again, I've heard people talking about this, apocalyptic visions. Oh. This stuff just starts happening. And I could see and peer into the Middle East and all these fucking nutcases over there. Oh, man. And the decisions that they're making and how there is a genuinely genuine nuclear threat through Iran because Good there are some Lord. people are fine, the Persian people are fine, but the leadership are nutcases. They're violently evil. And they 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 do want to blow everything up, and I'm like I don't I shouldn't specifically say Iran, but there are people over there that that are that way. Mm. And, um, that's what I saw, and I could see it was almost like they were in MS DOS cartoon format. This is all playing out <laughs> like that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I know. But then, yeah. but then this is this is when it. I went through that for a bit, and I'm going, why? And my question is, why are you showing me this? Like, for starters, what the hell can I do about it? Yeah, even, even if they are going to blow up the world and. But then she showed me their timelines, and then it's, and then I started to the, the 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 reality of our existence was then revealed. And it's like you've got to pitch what you've got to be very intentional in life. And I could start, you know, the rail maps. You know what of rail course. maps look like. You know, it looked yeah. a lot like that. It's like we can go on this rail map, or you go on that one, or you can go on this track or that track. It mm-hmm. was it started to it made sense to me. But you've got to be very intentional. You've got to focus on which one you want to go to with well. your life. And um, okay, so you're saying that's not an outcome. That's just our timeline based on the way people are thinking. Yes, that's just an outcome. Mm-hmm. Okay, so we're not all going to die. Well, we could, but it's just that that's a timeline and if enough people start focusing on that, then that's what's going to happen. Well, that's mm-hmm. me talking about it now, but that's what my conclusion from it was. So that that part of the journey ended and then it went into this massively personal side of it, which just, that was, you'll understand why I gave up alcohol now. This is why it makes sense. So I... um. Yeah, it's it's tough to talk about, man, to be honest with you, but I need to do it. So it's I got shown that I had two timelines in my life. One was mm. very short, one was a lot longer. Mm. So basically I said, I okay, show me the short one. And I kept drinking. And it was like I went straight to when I was at my I got in bed saying goodbye to everybody. Ugh. But I could I could step into the grief that my my especially my eldest daughter was having about me dying. And I'm like, no, 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 I don't yeah. want to go there. And I could step into it. I'm like, I, I was, you know, I'm doing this and I'm like. That's like a whole new level of pain right there. I could feel it. And it was like, I was changing her timeline. <laughs> I was shifting it by dying young because I was shown that what would happen with alcohol is I'd get pancreatic cancer and that's it. Ugh. I wouldn't recover from it. So nothing, I just get it one day and then that's it. Within a couple of months, I'd be dead. And it wouldn't even <laughs> show with, with someone. Because this is what happens with a lot of people. And, of and I could see it was like that with me. There'd be no warning sign. They'd just be done and you wouldn't recover from it. And that's when you and the, the Obi-Wan Kenobi said, you have to start looking after your health. Now the first thing, you cannot touch alcohol again. That's it. You're done. Oh. And I was like, yeah, I'm fucking done. But then I could go around to all of the people like my sister-in-law and my wife and I could actually feel what they were feeling. And I could, I remember the conversations I had with them. It was very – and then, then I died. And I stepped into where we go to afterwards. Hmm. And it's very difficult to describe, but one thing I can tell you and anybody listening is that we've got nothing to worry about. You go back to pure source, love or energy or what have you, and hmm. you have complete choice there and you are supported. So basically every good thought and feeling you could ever have about anything and everybody, yes, we return to that. So that's what I can tell everybody. So that's oh, why wow. my, my any fear I've ever had of death has just evaporated, it's gone. Like I'm not worried. I, I stepped into it, mate. I forgot my name. Like I stepped into it and I could see that we're all just identities in the here and now, but we're an infinite self and we stand in front of what, as, was, as I could see, like a roulette wheel and it just stops and now you've got this face you've got on now and I've got this face and then the yeah. next, next dimension, it's just roll it again and then you've got another one on. And it's mm-hmm. all just about the evolution of the soul and what you choose to do in this world because it's like a physic, it's like a gym. You're getting stronger. Your right. spirit's getting stronger by being here and you're evolving. Mm-hmm. That was sort of parallel that was going on as well. That was all being explained. So wow. it sounds like I got the the data, the, the big thing, but then the, the positive side of it was, oh, wow, okay, so, uh, oh, yeah, and there was a really awful bit in the, the shorter timeline where I could step in, I like, I could see my my children had grand, grandchildren and there was like a really nice, like in a resort environment and- mm-hmm. Cut tonight, and I remember my wife was just in tears, saying, Ugh. "I wish you were here." 
and I'm standing next to her, but in spirit form going, I am here. I'm so sorry. I can't be there. I just want to let you know that I'm here. But of course, you can't communicate. It doesn't work that way. But mm-hmm. I'm standing next to her and she's in tears just going, you need, you should have been here to see where our family ended up, meaning this is everything that you wanted and it's here. Mm. If you're not here for it. Yeah, that has to be tough to watch. Jeez. Oh, I was in tears, mate. I mean, it's for, for months afterwards, every time it's probably, this is probably the first conversation I can talk about where I don't cry because mm. I was, it's, you're, you're fucking there, mate. You're actually yeah. there. And, um, I, um, I, and then and there was a few other things, but that's the important stuff to share. When I, when I flipped over to the longer timeline, it's interesting. The first thing I saw was 70,000 tons of metal to cruise. And I was like, okay, here we go. Because it shows you these things and you're like, okay. And, and I could see, and it, I don't know what I expected or I wasn't even thinking about going on it. It was just, you need to go on that cruise was, was what they said, was what you need to be on it. It will change everything. Okay. Nothing changed when I was there. We'll see what comes from it. It's a bit like, you know, the first time I did the circle and didn't didn't stop drinking alcohol straight away. But yeah. So I thought, okay, I'll go on it. And then I started to see it started to go a bit deeper. And I remember it specifically, I was having a really in-depth conversation, but face to face over dinner with Mark Jansen from Epica of all people. Mm. And we were going really deep and I could peer into his mind and he's like thinking about me going, I really want this guy to write my book. That's what came up through mm. him. So we'll wait and see what it comes with that. What comes up with that? But then, but then beyond that, I could see this longer timeline. I was with family. You know, all of the usual trails of life are still there. You know, all of the usual bullshit, the financial constraints, the you know, dealing with the heat and the weather or the cold in your case or whatever. All that stuff's still there. But I could see, I could see all of these books that were written that I'd written, and then I was like, "This is what you're meant to do." This is oh, so books that you haven't written already that you're yeah. going to write. Yeah, it was like a library shelf, and they were just there. Boom, they're, they're, they're there. <laughs> and your 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 task could you should you choose to accept it, and it's yeah. totally up to you. This is the message. It's totally up to you, but it's it's there for you if you want. Oh, that's and, cool. And then it and then it sort of morphed out of that into more of the um, fractals. And again, you don't choose what this stuff just appears. I started to see how the pyramids, what the function of the pyramids were after that. And wow. um, I could see like, you know, four-sided pyramid um, and it was in Central America, actually. I knew that. It was in Central America and there was like the hunters were at one base, the beautiful young women were at another base, there was the farmers and the 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 and the people who were in primary industry at another base and there was a priest class at another base. And they were all doing like yoga. They're all doing this yoga and that's very bizarre. the energy that was coming down through. It's like a back and forth between their yoga movements and the energy that was coming through the pyramid toward them and back. <laughs> yeah. <What? laughs> yeah, I know. And I could see this plain as day. This is going on. And these women that's were crazy. These women were so beautiful. It was just unbelievable. Um, it was just they were all basically perfect. And how long did the whole experience last on that that last? Oh, six hours, five, six hours. Wow. So when you came to, was it like a right there or was it like a slow, gradual type of? Ah, it's a very linear. Thank God it's not a come to. I don't think you could process it. It's very linear. Mm. You get out of it and you um, you get out of it and you just changed. I was just changed after that. And I, no. I drove home the next morning and driving driving home here felt like driving to somewhere brand new, a route that I've taken really? and didn't any other place in my life that I've taken lived here for 14 years, more than any other place I've ever lived longer. So than a newfound ever. appreciation for what you already had all these years. Maybe it just felt like to, to, to the, what I was explained to the, to the earlier journey, I'm on a very different frequency now. Mm. That's what happened. So I was on a previous frequency before and now I'm on a different one, a higher one. I feel like I've got nothing to lose. Um, I've got a job to do. I'm very, this year has been ridiculously busy. Like I can't keep up at the moment with the amount of opportunity. In a good way? Yeah, in a really good way. Yeah, not. I'm not not stressed. I'm just. That's good. I'm just, you know, like I've had to reschedule our meeting. You know, it's, there's just been that much on. People are coming out of the woodwork. And That's great to hear though. 
Yeah, and I, I, whether it's from this or not, I don't know, but I just think I've got a lucid mind courtesy of not drinking alcohol and an appreciation for what happens after death in particular that I feel like I've got nothing to lose and I just want to squeeze every last drop out of life because of that. Wow. That's really a tremendous story. For those just joining us, he's describing his experience at a Taylor Swift concert. and <laughs> to, No. <laughs> well, it's... That, uh, that's really intense, man. That's that's some serious uh, shit right there. Yeah, I, I'd I'd encourage look anybody who wants to make long term meaningful change. I'm not going to knock modern psychotherapy because I don't know anything about it. I'm going to say how I did it, and that's how I did it. And, yeah, that's and, it's good to have those options though to show that there's more options other than just you know ABC. You know, people need to hear that because. Each each person has a unique path that they need to follow to find their own, uh, you know, solution for their own problems. And this could very well help somebody else out there right now. Yeah, I hope so. I hope it does because the help is available. You've just got to ask for it. But yeah. it's a spiritual request. It's not, you're not going to find it through, look, Western medicine is great, okay? You know, we don't get mm -hmm. vaccines that are out there these days, maybe not the COVID fucking bullshit, but <laughs> all, the, all the other ones... We know keep you safe, and they they we, we're now living longer than we ever have to the point where to the point where the biggest killer in the West is a disease of um, a state of mind or obesity. Yeah, and and that can easily be fixed, but it's not cancer anymore. Or I think I think suicide has overtaken cancer, hasn't it? In some parts of the developed world, it's crazy. Yeah, I believe it as a cause of death. So, but it's you've got to ask for this help, and you've got to be open minded very open-minded about things and be prepared to, to, to actually go through the change. I, uh, I don't think, uh, you know, when I, when I think of Jesper, I, I, the only question I'd ever have for him before having this, this type of a discussion with someone like Jesper is that, do you want to give up alcohol? Cause I did. Mm -hmm. And I did, but if you don't want to, then don't, because you know, you yeah. still go back to God. You're not going to be abandoned. We're never abandoned. I could see that. We just feel like we are yeah. but we're never abandoned. We just, go back to God and then you can stay in spirit form for as long as you need to heal and stuff. And then you can come back and try to do it all over again if you want, but you want to yeah. do it because the thing is it's the only game in town evolution, spiritual evolution is the only game in town. And I wonder how Jesper's bandmates feel because I haven't really read anything about them other than, you know, we wish him well and all that, but it has to be tough to witness that firsthand on their end and vice versa and kind of see that relationship split for such a prominent band like that, yeah, I, I think there's a lot of love for him. That's what I that's what I've heard firsthand. Uh, it's yeah. just what he is going through is clearly extraordinarily tough on him, mm -hmm. and I wish I wish him I wish he would find. I, I've got to be clear. I was never an alcoholic, so I don't know what an alcoholic would have to go through. I just wanted to stop drinking alcohol. It's a different yeah. paradigm. Like alcohol mm -hmm. has to give up alcohol, you know. Yeah, um, I suppose in my own way I had to too. Otherwise, I'd get that cancer and die. But it'd be all knowledge retrospectively obtained. Sure. Um, but I, I get blood tests done, and I don't have any issues with liver damage or anything like that. So, uh, Jesper, you can see Jesper's bloated. You can see that, and I don't know whether he's drinking these days or whether he's the the whether he's just not drinking but still an alcoholic because that's the problem with it. Mm -hmm. Is with alcohol is that you can. Um, you could not touch alcohol for 50 years, but still be an alcoholic. And that's a terrible indictment. Yeah. Mm. I don't even have the, like, it's just no longer, it, it'd be like telling me to go and drink a, you know, a milkshake. It's like, well, why would I do that? You know, I, I don't want yeah. to. You know? It's I'd look at it the same way. It's just, just not a choice that I want to take. Mm. But it's not yeah. a bad or a good choice. It's like, I'm not, not going to do that. Just not like, part of who you are now. Yeah, it's been it's been removed, and I've never had any issues with illicit substances, so I don't have to work on that. So it's just a case of now getting everything done, mate. You know, which you can relate to being a muso with a family trying to get everything done. It's, yeah, it's strange when you get older too, because you, when you're young, you have the world at your fingertips, and you kind of look at like all these possibilities and stuff, and it's like the world is so vast. And I don't know about you; I'm not sure if you feel the same way, but when you have a family and when you have kids. The world kind of shrinks and it just becomes about them and it's like 
everything I do revolves around them and making sure that little guy is okay and his world is going to be, you know, safe and sound and all that before I think of myself. Well, just by being a father and actually being present in their lives and working on your, because no relationships are easy, meaning with our wives, you know, they all have their yeah. challenges and twists and turns and stuff. God, God help us, they do. And uh, the fact that we just haven't abandoned our families is probably 90% of it. Yeah. Probably 90% true. of it, mate. And I think being there and being in the household when your kids wake up and helping getting lunch for school organized and getting them organized and dinners ready and stuff, that's that's being a parent, you know, that, that day in, day out. It's not the taking them to the movies and buying a huge thing of popcorn and Coca-Cola like <laughs> the Hollywood impression of it is. It's being to, to – a, when I look back as a fully-fledged adult, when I look back on my past relationships with girls when I was, you know, 18, 19, 20 up to – 28, you know, before I met my, my wife, um, the ones that were the most torrid relationships were to a person with women who lacked a, lacked a positive father figure. Mm. It does terrible yeah, things true. to kids, lacking yeah. a father figure. They are, they are emotionally uh, unstable, a lot of women. Probably blokes too, but only dated girls <laughs> for obvious reason. <laughs> so, 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 but yeah, I, yeah, I noticed that too, big time. And it's, um, yeah, just but we, we've got a job to do, man. I mean, our, our most important job is being a householder and parent and husband. Oh yeah, and there are times when I do question if I should leave this, uh, you know, house and abandon the family because they get me sick every two weeks. But that's uh. You know, I'm kidding around, obviously, but, you know, it's worth it. And I'm trying to make the point that, like, you kind of got to be, I wouldn't say psychotic. There's got to be a part of you that's almost, like, twisted in a way to be able to put up with this stuff constantly, day in and day out, and dealing with, like, you know, this kid that's just this human bacteria pit that's constantly getting sick and, like, complaining and asking all these weird questions and then just putting up with it day in and day out and then it kind of reminds me of being a musician where, or any creative type where you kind of have to have like something off a little bit to be able to withstand that and to be able to put yourself out there and say, Hey, look at what I do and all that. I don't yeah. know. It it's, takes a special kind of brain to be able to put up with that stuff. Not saying it's good or bad. And, you know, people with kids are better than people without kids or anything like that, but it's just a different type of life. And it's interesting. The older I get, the more I notice that. Yeah. I was just talking to my wife last night. I thought that I don't, this is going to sound really judgmental and it probably is, but in a lot of instances, I don't trust people who have arrived at our point in life and don't have kids and don't have a family. The reason why is because you grow up. It's as simple as that. When you've got kids, you grow up. You really, you're the, yeah. it's the final stage. And I, I know there are, there are all sorts of reasons people don't go into having kids. And I understand that. But from a spiritual growth perspective, nothing is more rewarding than having a family and children and raising kids, okay? And nothing replaces it. Nothing can replace it. You know, my sister and sin laws a lesbian, so she's just got a dog and she treats the dog better than we even treat our kids, to be honest with you. But, you know, it's, <laughs> not, it's not the same. You know, it's not the same. <laughs> it's, uh, it's, it's kind of odd looking at it. And uh, – I don't blame her for that because obviously she has no intention of starting a family and uh yeah. but um and she's a good person too. It's not like she's not a good person, but um yeah, I just it's just I, different, I, yeah. Yeah, it's just different. And I just noticed the expectations that I get out of people that don't have kids that are at our station in life, you know, late thirties, forties. Um, they're still sort of thinking in that early twenties mindset. And uh yeah, very much I get that a lot. A lot of complaining, a lot of you know, when am I going to get my turn and blah, blah, blah. And <laughs> I don't know. Yeah, I, I, I'm glad I've, I've trod the path that I have up to this point. I'm glad, I'm glad for everything because it's all down to experience really. And yeah, uh, absolutely. It's been a, a magnificent accompaniment to it all and the ability to talk to people and then create in my own terms as well. Not, at, not at the level you're doing it at, but still being able to play every weekend in that way, being a performing musician, which is all I ever wanted to be, truth be told. Yeah. All I ever wanted to be is, is a regular performer, and I, and I get to do that. There you go. So It's, it's funny. It was, um, I think it was Peter Steele who said that music is like sonic therapy, 
which is an adage that I've always lived by because especially with this last record, um, I just wrote about this recently. Like it's hard for me to let go of this record and put it out because it's almost, it's a piece of me. And this is the record that my mom died when I was recording this Hmm. and COVID hit and all that shit while I was recording this and all this heavy shit happened where when I first started writing this record, it was just, you know, another metal album, whatever, sing about this and that. And then all this real life stuff started happening and I was just pouring it all into the music. And it was so therapeutic to where now I have to let go of that and be done with it and put it out into the world and forget about it and let it do its thing. And it's really tough to let go of, but at the same time, it's been so beneficial because it's given me an opportunity to kind of let go of all that stuff that's been in here and just kind of put it all into the music. Yeah. Just to, just another point about, about the ayahuasca journeying. Uh, I absolutely saw that, that it's being a creator is not actually about the audience. It's about you doing what you're meant to do. And oh, sure. you, yeah. you, when you cross over, you will feel that, that well being associated with completing a creative artifact, like what you've done. So regardless of who listens to it, you're going to look back very favorably when you get that chance to review your life. I believe you're going to look back very favorably on that episode and go, that was worth it. Mm. Oh, definitely. I think so. And I think about how, like, I don't really, I don't have a big fan base, you know, it's very modest, but just making these connections here and there to certain people. Um, there was, I'm not sure if I told this story last time there was a girl who messaged me and she said that her husband had become ill and he had lost the ability to speak and something had happened. I think it was a stroke or something and he wasn't moving. He wasn't talking and all this. He was a fan of uh, the music I make. Mm -hmm. And she said when she played him one of my songs, he like came to for the first time and was like responding and stuff. And it was like familiar to him. And we've been keeping in touch uh, back and forth and I've sent him, I just sent him a t-shirt that's going to be coming out soon. He was the first one to get one of the new pieces of merch, but stories like that, regardless of the size of my audience, it's a story like that. Isn't that's enough to keep me going and kind of keep, I don't know, motivating me to do this because those little connections that are happening are just they they make it worth it and knowing that when i'm gone this music is going to live on beyond me and right. it's going to hopefully still make those connections because you know my body will be gone but that part of me is still going to live that's really rewarding to think about it's have you seen those memes that go around where where in uh not in the 1990s or thereabouts people were share it there's one image like this is what my grandmother looked like and it's some old lady in a bonnet and a model t ford this sort of no, thing she was growing up it. and then they fast forward to 2055 and they say this is what my grandmother looked like and it's some bitch with huge fish lips going <laughs> like this <laughs> sort of thing and my point in it amongst that is that is that long after you've gone to your point when people look up what granddad did and what, mm. what he was up to, they've got this. And the digital artifact, it's, it's going to be here for, it's, it might change form, meaning the way we look at things, the screens or what have you, but the actual artifact will remain. And that's oh, the beauty of it all. And, and you're creating things, not with eternity in mind, but keyword here, legacy. You, can, you create, yeah. you should be, I know I'm doing that too, with all the conversations, 100%. it's just legacy. It's, it's there. If anybody wants to listen to it, it's there. You don't, whatever, but. Those who do, and we both have an audience, okay? People do. So there you go. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I said that last time that what you're doing is tremendous because you're making this archive of history and just putting it out there where, you know, someday I can't imagine like what I would do as a teenager who just fell in love with metal, stumbling on the stuff that you have, like to think of some kid who's just coming up now and he's searching YouTube or podcasts or whatever. And all of a sudden he stumbles on this gold mine that you have of interviews and content where it's like, you know, that in and of itself is just invaluable right there. Yeah. That's awesome. Great to hear me. Great feedback here. Yeah, I get one of the best pieces of, uh, one of the best messages I've received or received recently. Um, I can't remember the guy's name, but he's from Serbia, but, um, 
he said, I've got a podcast. Here it is. He goes, you inspired me to start it. There you go. And I'm oh, like, wow. fucking hell. Okay, that's that's huge, man. And you only need one or two of those messages to come along basically ever, and you're like, I'm good. I'm good now because yeah. I don't expect much. Yeah. I don't expect much. I don't get – okay, I, go, I don't know about you, but I go through – phases where i get trolls so it might be a, a week where i get five or six comments that are really derogatory <laughs> <laughs> and then nothing for like months or even a year <laughs> oh nice i don't know what happens with that but uh overwhelmingly my, the the commentary that i receive is is neutral to very positive uh, you get a lot of angry uh cradle fans i i mentioned that to Lindsay. actually i said the the my i am the sworn enemy of the danny fanboy <laughs> <laughs> and they're all blokes. They're all men who just really oh, of course. Strange. They're all these blokes, and I see the comments that they write. What would he fucking know? He's in love with Stuart. All his comments, and, and it's like, dude, oh man, you know, you weren't around back then. I understand that your perspective on things is recent, but I don't even bother arguing. I just leave it and and walk away. I've learned that's why when I see people arguing with people online, I'm like, you were creators, just don't do it. Oh just, sure. Walk yeah, you away. can't go down that road. No, no, you can't. Some of them have been really personal too. Some of the, some of them have been like, oh, I believe you're, it. You're bellicose. You fucking talk too much. <laughs> you Australian fuckwit. Um, all this shit, and it's like, okay, all right, whatever. Yeah, um, it says more about you that you're saying that. Exactly. That you're unhappy enough that you want to share that opinion because that's what yeah. that tells me. And then, of course, I think one of them I looked into was one man black metal project from phoenix arizona you know like it's a, the one, <laughs> one you know one, i know i know why you're one man mate don't worry yeah <laughs> you don't have any friends you know so, <laughs> so of course so i just i just left it and the algorithm buries it anyway because nobody upvotes it or downvotes it i don't i don't get people who like yeah. negative comments about me and stuff i can't, there was once or twice there where i got into an argy bargy with a couple of people but I learned. I learned not to. That, that it, it yeah. does nothing, and especially some of the political opinions I've been sharing with the, well, it's the artists who talk about it, and I just offer mine, and then they they try to demonise and and stuff. Particularly all these hardcore lefty types. There's not. Yeah. There's not really many of them around. It's really that's a media narrative that there's not many of them around. But when you get one, you, they're pretty full on. No, oh, I can get pretty nasty too. Yeah, that they can. Um, I haven't had. I've only had one or two. I've had one create a Reddit thread about me. Um, oh, lovely! Calling, calling me far right or something, which is okay. <laughs> whatever, whatever that means these days in 2024, are we? Yeah, yeah. I whatever can't keep that, track. I can't keep track. I mean, literally these days, unless you're pro critical, pro critical race theory, pro absolute no borders, pro zero taxes for anybody except for the ultra rich, you're basically far right. So, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> so, I offend everybody on the planet as soon as I walk out the door because <laughs> I don't stop swearing. I talk shit. I make fun of people. I laugh about it. And that's kind of what I'm known for. So I'm screwed either way. I, unfortunately, I'm going to have to wrap things up, but I want to ask you one more question. What are the chances of you going on 70,000 tons of metal next year? Oh, wow. Good question. I don't know. I've never thought about it. Oh, okay. well, are you going to be going again? I'm going again. Yeah, it'd be great to catch up. That's all. That's uh, I'd, I'd, I think that's the only reason I'd I'd have to sort of go back to the states. Um no. I got invited, and because I, I get invited over to do it, so um, that's. And I oh, thought well, I had a good enough time this time around that I'd go back and do it again. Yeah, well, I'll put that on the idea map. I never even considered it. Mm. Yeah, Judging from your experience, it sounds like a pretty good time. I just you know my view on it. Do it once. If don't like it, nothing ventured, nothing gained. I get it costs a couple of grand, but you know, all yeah. of those do. All of those do cost a bit about that sort of money. So, um, but yeah, but uh, look, if you're uh, if you're interested or what have you, let me know. No, definitely appreciate the idea, and I appreciate your time tonight having the chat. I wish you had longer time. It's just that I've got a I've got work. Uh, it's the middle of it's quarter past uh, midday here, so. Get back to oh, work yeah. and um, get all of that done. But um, mate, just for everybody who's who's tuned in, um, your your new album, okay? When is it coming out, or is it already out? And where can they tune in? I'd say that's the thing. I don't have a hard date. March 
it's done. Um, if they want to follow me on social media or just go to autumnseyes.com, they can figure out, you know, more info as it comes out. I'll have a hard date soon. I would say within the next week, I'll have a hard date put out there. And uh, yeah, we should be good to go on that front. Have you got anything on iTunes at the moment? Like the new stuff, like a single or anything? Yeah, there's uh let's see, the single from October. It's a music video for that. That is um called Follow the Embers. And then the latest single is called Faith in Cycles. And that was released a couple of weeks ago, I believe. Yeah, there that's you go. more of like a thrashy song. Gotcha. Yeah, I can see that there now. That's good. Um if you're cool with it, I'm just gonna play one at the end of the show. Yeah. So people go know for what it. it sounds like. Um appreciate it. I'll put it up there and then that way, mate, hopefully you get a few people. Um, people love these long form conversations, by the way. They uh, they prefer that to, yeah. the, uh, to the shorter bursts. I think some people like the shorter bursts, but the long form conversations, because people are working, right? And they're doing construction, oh, yeah. but they got AirPods in and they want to listen to the entire thing. Yeah. Well, that Sarah conversation was your record breaker, wasn't it? Was yeah. that four hours? That was actually six, but the oh. edit. Yeah. Six hours? Mm-hmm. Yeah, oh we, um, it got. We were talking for so long. I think at one point Sarah said to me, "You look tired. We better stop." <laughs> so so um, <laughs> oh, she shared man. with me a bunch of other stuff which I, which I just can't talk about. So yeah, it's, yeah. I I could write a book on the things that people have asked me not to talk about from Cradle. Yeah, it sounds like it. Yeah, no doubt. Could have two Point. books: one about Cradle and one about the stuff you're not supposed to talk about Cradle. Between Lindsay, uh, Paula Lender, um, Sarah, and the Ryan brothers, yeah. Yeah, it's all there. It's crazy. Yeah. That's funny because I talked to Sarah, or not Sarah, uh, Lindsay, years ago when she first joined Cradle. I interviewed her on my site because occasionally (laughs) I talk to people on my site and do Halloween and horror movie stuff or metal, whatever. And my conversation with her was all like positive. That was like when she was fresh in the band and it was like, oh, I love it. It's great. Blah, blah, blah. And then you kind of just saw things just. Yeah, it was. I had a conversation with her when she did a solo tour of Australia when she was right in the middle of a cradle tenure. So 2017, mm. I think it was. And yeah, it was very positive about it all. But I knew. I just knew because I'd already spoken to Stu by then. Um, yeah. Uh, what was probably going to happen behind the scenes and when it comes out i would say that that chat will be as impactful who would who would it, it, it's, it's got to be up there with the nick chat oh wow well. not quite at the same level as stewart mm-hmm. era because those two were to your point i and it's not me doing that they're groundbreaking because of what they decided to talk about yeah of course them. yeah you know it's not me mm-hmm. them. But they're groundbreaking for their reasons and the amount of messages i get about the Stuart and the sarah one alone eclipse everything else that i get so oh, wow that sarah one reached five thousand views within a couple of weeks on on youtube i think i've wow. never had anything do that it was just boom. wow huge and um wow. Yeah, and the commentary. I actually did a live because I did a premiere first and I've done that. Um, oh, cool. A lot of the freaks come out of the wall with that one, let me tell you. There's some guy pretending to be a frog in there or something. So, <laughs> yeah, I don't know. Is it, what are you doing, mate? That's curious. Like, some people are being serious and, yeah. But um, um, if they're Lindsay... I'm looking can, forward to the uh, Lindsay one. I, 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 I won't release it until she she gives me the – she might not. I Look, you know, you, you know me well enough, mate, from the perspective of that I say to them, it can come out or it doesn't have to. It's up to you. Okay? I'm not seeing Did she have second thoughts after the interview or was it – No, we, we didn't speak much. We didn't speak much um, after the interview. I've just – um, I sent it to her. She said, yeah, I'll have a listen. There was – you know, Christmas happened and then – we were messaging a little bit, but then I finally, after I got back from 70,000, I said, what do you want to do? And she said, I'll, I'll listen to it again. So I know she's busy and I'm not going to bug her. You know, it's just yeah. not, I mean, like she, my experience with these things is the longer you, the wait, the chance of it coming out is very little. Mm. Um, but I mean, one day when we catch up for a, a soda water and a coffee, you can have a beer. <laughs> um, uh, I'll share, I'll share with you. I can share with you. I know that, but I just um, yeah, 
yeah, I'll share with you one day when we catch up, mate, some of this other stuff. But between Paul and Lindsay and um, the Ryan brothers, man, it's all there. There's yeah. just no fucking way you you join that band. Um, knowing what has gone on now, I, I can't believe they get the caliber of musicians that they do in there these days. Yeah, that's pretty nuts. Yeah, but that's just that's just the deal. It's, I don't think it's just Cradle either. I, we can talk about Cradle because the people, the, the, all of those those musicians, as you know, are very highly articulate. They're educated. Um, they've got other things going on in their lives. They've just got a story to share. You know, well, at least he's not partnering with somebody like Ed Sheeran or anything. I mean, yeah, I don't know what Danny thinks. I'm not sure if you heard that news or not, or if that joke went over your head, but that's his next project. Well, I, I wasn't sure. To, to your point there, I didn't know whether he was just trolling, whether he's his mates, because they're both no. the same soccer team or something, or it's for real. It's a it's a project. Oh, there. it's the real deal, yeah. See, Ed Sheeran is so big in Australia, he holds the record. He, he's eclipsed dire straits for selling the most tickets. Are you kidding? I wish I was. How do you eclipse dire straits? He's a fucking legend. I don't know. Dire Straits in 1985 and 86, I think across the two years, played something like 50 or 60 dates in Australia alone because they were that big. But He's playing to theatres and um, centres, you know, like entertainment centres, whereas Ed yeah, Sheeran yeah. was playing stadiums. Oh, wow. So if you do four or five gigs in a row at the Melbourne Cricket Ground or whatever, that's almost 400,000 people. It's It just blows my that's mind nice. that there are. I, know, I don't know that he did that many in MCG, sorry, but I know he, he has the record in Australia for the most tickets sold. But that's I just I can't. I don't, again, it's a bit like the Taylor Swift thing. I mean, as if I would, but I don't know anybody that listens to that shit. So no. I just know he's huge. It's like, who's buying this fucking shit? Where are you? Are you hiding <laughs> or something? You know, it's like, it's, I don't understand. Well, now those angry Danny Phil fans are going to be buying it too. <laughs> yeah, there'll be some, uh, they'll, they'll Ed Sheeran will post it and there'll be some guy saying, yeah, that Scars and Guitar guy now can eat his word or something. Because <laughs> I see those comments occasionally elsewhere. Oh, yeah. Those will be coming in too. <laughs> yeah, Look I wish, forward to that. Just for the commentary that I had with Lindsay about the Danny Phil fanboys, I hope it comes out just for that. Because <laughs> that would be good timing. Because she knew exactly what I was talking about. She's met them. Yeah. You know, the blokes who fawn over Danny, it's really kind of gay, actually. <laughs> yeah, that's a whole different conversation. Oh, it's it's bizarre to worship a singer like that. It's not even that great a one, but whatever. To each their own, I suppose. <laughs> yeah. Some people still like Nickelback. <laughs> as, I, as I get off the conversation, the camera will pan out and reveal like five Taylor Swift posters <laughs> behind here. I'm trying to think it was before Taylor Swift too, was it? I'm sure there are. Miley Cyrus, there you go. Yeah. I, I don't yeah. Know. There's yet. always somebody. Every, every generation has them. God bless them. At least they're listening to music, I suppose. But it's... It's the message if you, you want to call it that music. Yeah, I, I, I can't do it. You can't avoid it because you go into a shopping center and shake it off or whatever that song will will be playing. <laughs> Something like, yeah, can I? Yeah, can. you know, like yeah. when we finish playing at a pub, that music will often come on. Oh God. The venue and Miley Cyrus and we actually, admittedly, I have to play a lot of that stuff. Not Taylor because it's too far out there or Justin Bieber. Yeah. But Miley Cyrus, Kylie Minogue have to play all of that shit. And uh, that's when I just stick hot forks in my eyes and call it a day. I just, you know what? I, it doesn't even, truth is, man, it doesn't even register with me that I'm playing that. Because <laughs> it's just, just blank song. out. And... It's another song, and the 50 odd songs we've got to play that night. I'm just trying to yeah. get And at certain points in a set, you're just trying to get through it because you're tired. Yeah. And you're thinking about work or the dog shit you've got to pick up when you get home that, you know, <laughs> you wake up that morning. These are the thoughts that go through your head, you know, of when course. you're. Playing all of these people getting drunk and stuff, and you're like thinking about household tasks, like that yeah. damn I filter. The air the tank is, is going to work. Yeah, yeah, the air conditioner's not working, or the damn bloody filter in the fish tank isn't working again, or something. <laughs> yeah. And in your break, I know the feeling. In your break, you're looking on Kogan or eBay for like a cheaper filter replacement part, and <laughs> I can the integration of our lives, mate, as householders with rock and roll is just hilarious at times. I find. Oh yeah, yeah. That's the behind the scenes nobody sees. Uh, the conversation. I love rugby league, like you know, football, and and uh, so I often judge uh, if we have a filling guitarist on how passionate, not passionate, but how much conversation we can have about football. And mm. uh, if we can have a conversation, as soon as they start talking about guitars, I'm out. You know, I'm like, <laughs> we are playing the guitars tonight. It's not about talking about guitars. Like someone, 
it turns up. I like a Les Paul Jr. better than a Les Paul stand. I'm like, ah, I'm out. Go, go. Yeah. You know, go. That's it's, it. It's, it's it's go. It's like, or if someone says, damn, the Tigers had a shocking game tonight. I'm like, indeed, they fucking did. They're terrible and they're my team. So, <laughs> <laughs> you know, oh, when they do that, I know it's going to be a decent night, you know. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Oh, that's funny. It's, Sweet, mate. Well, thanks heaps again. Let's uh, hopefully the next one doesn't take so long for me to sort of come around to, mate. But uh, always a pleasure to catch up, man. Yeah, definitely. appreciate it. Well, there you have it, ladies and gents. A conversation with my mate from New England in the United States, Dan Mitchell. He's got a project called Autumn's Eyes. There's some new music out right now. And I'm going to play some for you, but only if you've tuned in via the podcast apps. You know the deal. I can't play music via YouTube. This one's called Faith in Cycles. Once it's done, that'll be it. So we'll close the show with some music. I haven't done that before. First for everything. Before we get to the music, though, my name is Andrew Mackay-Smith, and I am the host of the Scars and Guitars podcast. Until the next one, it's a goodbye for now. <laughs>